All right, everybody, let's get started. Welcome everyone to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences Earth Day Streamathon. You have made it to what I hope is going to be a very exciting, informative, insightful, and science filled streamathon. We are going to be here for the next while bringing you the latest, greatest science from experts at the museum and beyond. We're here to talk about Earth. We're here to talk about what's going on on Earth, what's happening with conservation, biodiversity, what's the state of the planet right now. I love Earth Day. Listen, today is a very special Earth Day as well. Maybe you knew, maybe you didn't, but today is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. That's right, the very first Earth Day was 1970. And the first Earth Day, April 22nd, 1970, kicked off uh, an international movement of environmental policy and people beginning to think about the environment in new ways and really push hard to protect, learn more about, and save Earth, right? In, in the decades leading up to Earth Day, particularly like think the 50s and 60s, there had been a handful of sort of environmental disasters. And so conservation in the environment was sort of at the top of people's minds. This is what people were thinking about. And then you get this movement, this groundswell of people with Earth Day being organized that then have now pushed us in the last 50 years to, to great new heights of science, understanding biodiversity, and working in conservation to protect it. So that's what the Streamathon is all about. We are here to celebrate Earth Day. Uh, feel free to tag the museum if you're on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and you wanna talk about what we're doing, tag at Natural Sciences, use hashtag NC Earth Day 50, NC Earth Day 50, because we want everybody to be able to see what's going on. Uh, and you can use the chat box on YouTube, if that's where you're watching, or you can use the Facebook comments if that's where you're picking up our show tonight. And we'll be monitoring the questions and comments as they come in. And for each of our guest speakers in the time that we have, we'll share those questions with them and see what their thoughts are. So you can engage with us and the experts that have got lined up for you tonight. It's Earth Day, woo, I'm so excited. Uh, our first guest tonight is one that if you've been a fan of the Museum of Natural Sciences for any time now, then you've probably seen him speak. He's an author. He's a, a prolific science communicator. Uh, you can find this guy doing all kinds of amazing science projects. Uh, I think you can catch him on the Science Channel every now and then, uh, or running TV shows and being a part of some of the science stuff that goes on there. And if you visit the museum in downtown Raleigh, you can peek through the glass walls of the Biodiversity Research Lab, and you just might get a glimpse of Dr. Roland Kays working on some amazing new research project. Uh, Dr. Roland Kays is the head of the Biodiversity Research Lab at the museum. He's a professor at North Carolina State University, and he's got a cool podcast out that you want to know about called Wild animals. Roland, welcome to the Earth Day Streamathon. Great. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, when I was putting this lineup together, I was thinking, okay, who should kick it off? And having the person in charge of biodiversity research at our museum, an expert mammologist, and somebody who knows a lot about North Carolina wildlife as well, uh, seemed like a really good fit. Well, I'm honored. Thanks for the, uh, thanks for the invitation. So, Roland, uh, what are you thinking about this Earth Day? Well, I'm thinking about COVID because uh, I'm home all the time and um, I'm reading a ton of news about COVID. And uh, it's kind of had me reflecting on uh, wildlife uh, in our country and in other countries. And um, so when I'm not, uh, you know, I'm also, I've got tons of work to do. I've got lots of data that we've been collecting. Uh, um, and so plenty of work that my team's been working on, but, but what I want to talk to today is 
a little bit of reflection of um, wild con wildlife conservation in the United States and in the planet. It so you want me to go ahead and get started? Roland, take it away. Okay. <clears throat> Are we on the cusp of Earth's second wildlife conservation miracle? Um, and so I want to start by sort of putting you in a, in a place in time and to realize that in this place in time, it was a very, very dark time for animals. Um, illegal wildlife hunting ran rampant. Birds were being killed by the thousands, by the tens of thousands, by the hundreds of thousands, packed into tight little packages to, so they could be sold at the market. All sorts of wild, this wildlife trade, this commercialization of wildlife and selling it on the streets was completely emptying the forest. Once common animals were nowhere to be found, once rare species were now going completely extinct. Even some species that didn't taste good were still hunted for decorations because at this time, at the turn of the century, wearing feathers in, in the hats was kind of this high fashion for women. And so egrets and herons and other birds that eat just so they could get their feathers to put into hats. So this is the story of the United States about a century ago. Um, but some of it also fits Asia today. The species and the societal trends are slightly different, but the result has been the same. Unsustainable wildlife hunting leading to population crashes and extinctions. But now, if you're in your backyard somewhere looking out the window, you might be seeing abundant wildlife in North America. And indeed we do have, for many species in many places, really healthy wildlife populations. So how did this happen? This is what I call the first wildlife conservation miracle. So tonight, what I wanna do is explain how this came to be, and then talk about how I think that we might be on the cusp of a second wildlife conservation miracle in Asia today and in the near future. So let's start with the first wildlife conservation miracle in the United States in North America in general, especially the United States and Canada, sort of late 1800s, early 1900s, this was when, you know, at first when, when, when Europeans colonized North America, it was just the bounty was in so much of these natural resources. Um, but then things started to run out. This started off in the Northeast, um, in sort of Maine, New York area, along the coast. By 1878, the Labrador duck, the great auk, and the sea mink had all gone completely extinct. These are all species that lived on the coast where there were a lot of people. They were hunted, they were trapped, and before anyone even knew it, they went completely extinct by 1878. By 1880, the Eastern elk was gone. The elk was the largest um, uh, you know, native mammal that was in the Eastern United States. It was hunted completely, completely to extinction. By the late 1800s, uh, bison, in our, our largest land mammal in, in most of, of North America, which had once numbered 30 million was down to less than 100. So people started to notice. There were some laws passed, Michigan elk to ban, the uh, Michigan ban to elk hunting, Wyoming banned bison hunting, but a lot of these were ignored. People still had this frontier and uh, they were just shooting whatever they wanted, hunting whatever they wanted, selling it on the market, making lots of money or a little bit of money. Um, and so even things like deer, turkey, Canadian goose, bear were at this point becoming really rare hard to find and declining. Turn the century, in the 1910s, the Carolina parakeet and the passenger pigeon, pigeon went extinct. Two beautiful birds native to this area. And right around now was when we finally had our aha moment, that as a society we realized we needed to change the way we consume our natural resources. We realized we could use something up completely. These things were disappearing. We created better laws and enforced them for the first time, right? Passenger pigeon was potentially, probably, we, we don't have good numbers from this time, but it was one of the most abundant species of bird in the world, if not the most abundant. And in the 1910s, it was gone, completely gone. And people saw this decline in their lifetime and they realized that we needed to start doing something different. Everything that we've been doing in our whole human history of just using things up as living off the land, we needed to change that. 
And so we created agencies uh, and, 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 non, and, and non-governmental aid, um, organizations were created to support these new laws. And we created new sciences to inform these new laws. The whole science of ecology, animal populations. Um, and I think it's interesting because this might have been the first time in human history that we approach the brink instead of jumping over. That's why I think it's a miracle, right? There have been other times in other places, especially oceanic islands, right? Smaller systems where we just completely wiped everything out. There was no stopping. We chopped all the trees down. Uh, we stopped our unsustainable harvest and we turned our ingenuity from killing animals to saving them, to manage them for sustainability. In 1927 in North Carolina, we had our first state wildlife agency. And in the 1930s, basically every state had a game agency. And that's how it's still done today. The states did most of this work. They had federal help, but a lot of this was from the state. We had federal taxes on hunting um, stuff, hunting purchases that went to fund conservation. Um, We've got lots of heroes in here, right? Teddy Roosevelt was our president. He protected some of these lands for the first time. Um, Harriet Hemingway and Mina Hall established the the Boston Audubon Society and really rallied for people to realize they shouldn't be wearing birds on their head and these fancy hats. And that made a huge difference. There were all sorts of laws to protect migratory birds, to protect endangered species. Um, And these things worked. So in 1944, a little bit after the miracle, but the first time we finally had an estimate of how many deer were in North Carolina, they estimated it was about 50,000 deer. Today, it's 20 times higher than that, right? Deer, turkey, bear, Canadian geese, all these species have been managed to much higher abundances and sustainable harvest, right? So we still harvest and eat animals. This is a local thing that you can do, but we're just a lot more careful about it. We're careful about the way we butcher and, and preserve the meat and, um, and what happens with that. And we're also careful that we don't kill too many of them so they all go away. We've got other fur bearers that are trapped, right? Beavers, fishers, other animals you can still trap, sell the furs, but that's also done in a sustainable way. And those animals are all now thriving really across the landscape. So. I don't want to say that we in North America don't have any conservation challenges, right? We have habitat loss, we have climate change, we have pollution that are all causing problems. But unsustainable hunting is basically not a problem. And in fact, legal hunting helps fund conservation work for all sorts of species, whether they're hunted or not. So this is really the core of the uh, the, the North American wildlife miracle. Unfortunately. The same cannot be said for Asian wildlife populations, right? So Asia in general and China in specific has a huge demand for wildlife. And it's interesting to look back. I've I've been been looking into this a little bit more recently. It hasn't, uh, you know, so all societies have harvested wild animals, right? But in China, they had a famine in the 70s. And after that time, the government encouraged local farming of wildlife. So not just going out and hunting stuff, but bringing it in and farming it and growing it in cages. And these are mostly small backyard operations. And then in 1988, they changed the law that opened up massive factory farming, which had more animals packed in and a bigger variety of species. And around this same time, the Chinese economy went gangbusters, which meant everything scaled up. So they now have these massive factory farms of wild animals in China. And And this was legal. And this legal market also provided cover for illegal wildlife trade. So At this same time, China has international investment all around the world, building infrastructure, building mines, buying timber operations from countries all over Asia, all over Africa, all over Latin America. And just at the same time, all those other natural resources are coming into China. This illegal wildlife harvest was also coming into China. And this has been a complete disaster for wildlife populations. We think about rhino populations that have been plummeting because of them going after their horn because they say it's a, a it's an aphrodisiac or it cures cancer or they make up all kinds of things pangolins these amazing armadillo like mammals that have these scales on their uh, on their body um, are 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 hunted and poached and brought to china and sold because they think those scales have some sort of sort of medicinal product they're just made of keratin so chew your fingernails you get the same thing um, and yet uh, the pangolins are getting decimated even turtles 
turtles are like the slowest reproducing species we have out there, right? They live for a long time and they reproduce very slowly, even them, uh, even they're being harvested. So these um, operations have been devastating wildlife populations throughout Asia, for sure, uh, increasingly in Africa, uh, and now starting even in Latin America. Uh, a couple of uh, uh, colleagues that I advertise, that I interviewed for my podcast, the Wild Animals Podcast, have talked about problems they've had in uh, Mexico and in Panama. Um, you can listen to those, those just, just, just came out, so you can hear about some problems with wild cats uh, being poached and, and sent into the Chinese markets. And I think really the story that I heard that sort of hit home about uh, the, these empty forests came from a story about the durian fruit. So durian fruit is a fruiting tree in Asia that makes these giant fruits, almost the size of a watermelon, and people eat them. Some people love them, some people hate them. They have really strong flavor, a really strong smell, and they're just these giant mushy sugar bombs that have all kinds of nutrients. And so you can imagine for an orangutan, a durian fruit is like amazing. As for the deer and the wild pork pigs and the mice and all these other animals, um, this is like the most amazing food on earth. And in some places in Southeast Asia now, the durian fruits fall to the ground and rot because there's no animals to eat them. And that to me is just a sign that these really are empty forests. And that means of course that the durian fruit trees aren't getting their seeds dispersed. So it could be a bad thing for the ecology and the reproduction of those seeds as well. So this, this illegal hunting, this is the number one conservation problem for most mammal species in the world. If you look at the IUCN rankings of endangered species across the world, it's direct harvest. It's not habitat loss, it's not climate change, it's not pollution. Direct harvest is the number one cause of endangerment around the world. And China and other countries in Asia, but especially China, has been the biggest market for this illegal trade. So where do these animals go? Um, a lot of them go to these wet markets. People want to buy them live. They keep them alive. They want the freshest meat. Um, I've seen some terrible videos about them butchering them right there in the market. I saw this picture of a soup with a bat floating in the soup. The bat had just been killed. It had barely, it was still almost completely in, in just a, almost a practically live bat. And you probably know by now that it was from one of these wet markets that COVID-19 originated. Probably from a bat, maybe from bat soup, we don't know. Um, there may have also been some other species involved in this passing, but I think it's safe to say that these wet markets are where uh, COVID came from. They're where SARS came from before then. Uh, there's probably other diseases that has come as well. And so I don't need to tell you guys about COVID because everyone knows about COVID, but I think thinking about wildlife, that there has never been a more perfect time to shut down these wet markets, to shut down this illegal wildlife trade and to let these animals live their lives in the wild, not just for the animal's sake, but literally for the health of humanity, right? And China has taken notice, um, right? Their people have suffered. They passed a law and now they passed a law after SARS, but it wasn't permanent, it wasn't everywhere and it kind of went away, but this is different. The world is watching, consumers are watching. The permanent ban is hopefully coming in China. I don't think it's come yet. Uh, I've been trying to keep an eye on it, um, but people are noticing in China, there are entire villages that have had economies set up around the breeding of these wildlife. I read about one that was the snake village. Everyone there raised snakes. And they sold the snakes and they had some tourism business, but mostly it was selling the snakes for, for people to eat them. They realized their time's up. They realized snakes are no longer good business and they're shifting to other businesses. Um, so I have to think that bat soup is not going to be very popular in 2020 or 2021 or probably for a long time. Change, COVID is really a world changing experience. And I really hope that we can use this to foster a second wildlife conservation miracle and in this unsustainable illegal wildlife harvest. So thanks for listening. And if we have time, I'm happy to take some questions. This is where everyone claps normally. Yeah, this is, like where, this is where I tell everybody, yeah, jump, on, uh, jump in the comments and leave little clapping hands emojis for Roland. Be like, yay! Right. Yes. We, should, and, we should get a little soundtrack for that. Oh, I, we should play it at applause line. Right, yeah. Yeah, okay. Hey, tech guys in the background, see if you can get us an applause track. Um, but uh, 
if you're watching, you've got questions, comments, concerns, you can put those in the chat uh, wherever you're watching our video and we're monitoring those and we'll pose your questions here in just a second. Uh, but Roland, I'm kind of curious, um, what, was it just not seeing passenger pigeons in the sky anymore that convinced Americans that uh, conservation was a valid and worthy cause? Or were, was, there, were there economic factors? Like, was it just, oh no, all the birds are gone. What do we do? So it, it was it was less of a monument. It, it was a slow generational thing, I think, you know, because it, it happened over a couple of decades. And so it wasn't, it wasn't a single thing. I think the passenger pigeons were probably a big, a big part of it. And that's really when we finally saw in the 20s was when we finally saw that really, really happening. Um, but in this case, it was it was a little bit slower. And I think people, different people were seeing it at different times. And 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 it, what, what's interesting um, is, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've talked a lot um, uh, with Paul Brinkman at the museum, who's a historian about this as well. And he's been studying the same phenomenon. You know, some people j at that point just gave up. They did. There was no hope. They're like, oh, yeah, everything's going to go extinct. And we just need to accept that. And so that's how bad it had gotten was that it had, they had already just decided, oh, well, humans are taking over the planet and these things are all going to go extinct and that's just the way it's going to be. And so it took some real heroes uh, like, like, like the women that rallied against these, um, these, these, head, uh, these hats to say, no, we can save these things. And I think the bison was also one example where they did save it. There was not very money, but it was enough to sort of say, look, we can stop this from happening. And, and you need to have that hope for people to sort of realize and play along and go along with it. So uh, here's a question for you that's come in from the chat. How can estimating the population density or abundance help to manage areas that are destroyed by harvesting or would other things help? Good question, Andrew. Yeah. No, that's a good question. And that's, I like that question because I do, I do a lot of that, that work, especially with camera traps, uh, where we put out cameras to get counts of animals, right? And so that's a real, you know, one of the things you need to know, you don't know, I gave the example of the durian fruit, and then you know they're empty, but there's a lot of other gradations in between where species might be doing, you know, better or worse. And so um, having these to monitor how the animal populations are doing, and often you see the bigger ones go first. The ones that are are um, are more likely to be hunted, they disappear first. So um, if you start seeing that, then you know you might have a problem, and you need to look on, uh, you know, potentially some some law enforcement in that area and some prevention in that area in particular. Um, but then, it, you know, the the what I'm hoping with COVID is that it will change the demand, because that's where you know if there's a demand in a poor area. It, you know, it's, it's really hard to shut down these, these poachers that are poor and can make a little bit of money, you know, off the landscape. Um, and so I'm hoping the demand will die down. And then maybe eventually we can go to some kind of sustainable use where the hunting's more managed like we have in North America. More questions coming in. Uh, Jennifer is asking on behalf of 10 year old Haley, what is something we can do to help? Well, definitely, uh, um, we can support uh, international wildlife conservation and support the banning and the fighting of illegal wildlife trade. There are a lot of organizations that are already working on this. Um, there's a bunch of different groups that are working to snuff out the um, uh, the illegal wildlife trade. It's it's basically run. You know, it's, it's it used to be really sort of backwards, but now it's much more run by terrible um, syndicated organized crime. And so they're harder to shut down, but, but authorities are recognizing it. And so we do have some pretty serious authorities, police groups, you know, getting involved in recognizing this is really a problem and trying to shut them down and a bunch of NGOs that are working for that. So I think the best thing to do um, is to uh, support the, um, those efforts internationally. And then locally, you know, we have the, um, the local wildlife harvest hunting actually supports conservation. And so, you know, if you're interested in hunting, it, it's weird to, oh, I'm going to kill an animal to help animals, but actually, you know, hunting or fishing or, or, you know, using these resources in sustainable ways actually contributes to the conservation of the entire ecosystem because the money that goes into hunting helps buy land to protect the land that all the different species use. 
and yeah, we might shoot some deer on those lands, but um, the rest of the species are also protected. Excellent, excellent. Uh, here's another good one for you. How many animals have gone extinct in the past few years? Oh, uh, I don't have that number off the top of my head. And um, uh, I mean, I've heard some scary animals. statistics. Yeah, so the, the tricky thing is, it's hard to know when animals extinct for sure, right? Because um, some of them live in, um, uh, you know, you, they're, they're just hard to see. And so you don't know if they're still there. One of the more recent ones that, that I, I remember was um, the Baji, which is a, a river dolphin in China. And when they dammed the Yangtze River, I think it was, that dam really cut off a lot of their habitat. And that was um, a, a, a few years later was the last time they'd seen one of those. So they think that one's extinct. Um, there's another one we're watching very closely right now in North America in the Sea of Cortez uh, between, in uh, Mexico, between Baja, Mexico and mainland Mexico. Um, there is a, a very cute little dolphin called the vaquita. It's the smallest dolphin and there's very, very few of them. We're really worried about them going extinct. There's a lot of effort. Um, and the crazy thing is no one eats the vaquita, but there's this other fish that's got a gallbladder that the Chinese like. So it's worth a lot of money. So people are setting nets to catch this fish and the, the vaquita are getting caught in these nets. And so it's crazy. Just another example of how these Chinese markets can destroy wildlife populations, even if it's not the species that they're going after, just having all these nets in the water for this crazy high price that they can get for this fish is, is hurting the vaquita. So we're watching that one very closely. Still some around, but very few. So we're coming up on time to bring in our next uh, special guest speaker. So Roland, if people want to learn more about the work that you do, how can they find like stuff like your podcast? Sure. Well, my podcast is called Wild Animals. So you can find that anywhere you listen to podcasts or on the museum's website. Uh, look for Wild Animals. It's crazy stories about animals told by the people who study them. So I interview a different uh, person every time. This week is Bobby, the world's largest ocelot, uh, which was a really fun <laughs> story to tell. Um, and uh, that was especially fun because I, it, this is with a student that I helped do some of the research. So I actually met Bobby myself. Normally, I don't get to actually meet the animals that we tell. It's just the biologist tells the story. Um, and then I'm on Twitter, and you can find my homepage. If you Google Roland K's, you'll find both of those. Excellent. Roland, happy Earth Day. Great. Thanks so much for having me. We'll do the virtual handshake, fist bump. Boom. Boom. All thanks right. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for organizing this. I'm looking forward to the next talks. All right. Bye, Roland. So, everybody, here's what's coming up. Next, I want to give you a little sneak peek into what's happening with the next uh, hour or so of presentations. Uh, that way, you know, if you need to jump away and go get some more snacks and then come back for the rest of the streamathon, you've got time. So uh, my next guest is going to be Dr. Rachel Smith, who is an astrophysicist with the museum. And then after Dr. Rachel Smith, it's going to be fairy time with Tansy the fairy. That's right. You're going to want to stick around. Maybe get the kiddos around for that one as well. Real life fairy is going to be here for the Earth Day Streamathon with the Museum of Natural Sciences. After that, we're going to meet folks from North Carolina State University's turtle rescue team. They've got some cool stories that you're going to want to hear. And then at 8 o'clock, we're going to meet a North Carolina shark scientist, Chuck Bangley, somebody who's done a lot of work on the sharks that live right off of our coast. So. That's what's coming up for the next little bit. You're going to want to stick around and come back later. You can see the full schedule there in the description if you're watching on YouTube or the Facebook event page for the Streamathon if you want to know what's coming up for the rest of the Streamathon tonight. I'll go ahead and it looks like our next guest is here. Dr. Rachel Smith, are you there? I am here. Hey, Chris. Hey, Rachel. How are you today? I'm well. How are you doing? Doing fabulous, doing fabulous. Great. Thanks for being here. Thanks for showing Absolutely. up for the Streamathon. No, it's great. I should stick around for the ferry too. That sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. So everybody, uh, let me give you some quick details on Dr. Smith. Uh, she's head of the Museum's Astronomy and Astrophysics Research Lab, uh, a professor at Appalachian State University. And we're gonna take a little journey from Earth to our closest planetary neighbors. So I know it's Earth Day. We're doing a lot of Earth science, 
But a lot of the good stuff we know about Earth, we know because we've been able to leave the planet. And we can learn a lot of interesting things, I think, we're going to learn, by comparing Earth to some of our neighbors. So, That's Rachel, right. I'll, uh, I'll let you take it away. Awesome. All right. So let's go ahead. I'll share my screen here. All right. Well, hey, everybody. I'm excited to be here. If you saw, um, I did a science cafe a few, um, oh, let me see, a few weeks ago and uh, showed some of the, showed this software talking about astrobiology. And I'll be showing you guys uh, just sort of a quick tour about habitability of the Earth. This is Earth Day, the 50th anniversary, and what we can learn about Earth and our solar system. And we're going to take um, a quick view of Earth, look at some ways that we analyze the surface of Earth, and really consider habitability. What planets support life. And we're going to, to explore that, we're going to take, uh, we're going to start with Earth and then go to our neighbors on either side. So that's Venus, closer to the sun, and then Mars, away from the sun. So let's start looking at this view. This software, by the way, this is called Open Space. And um, it is a partnership with the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Um, and it is a NASA funded project to create this really awesome open source software. And I just want to point out that uh, many of you may have experienced internet issues being at home. Um, and that's one aspect of this uh, to, to realize is that what transmits to you may look a little choppy, but actually on, if you're at home using it or and on my screen, it looks really smooth. So that's one of the drawbacks, a little bit of having internet in the country where we live. So hopefully um, you'll get, uh, you'll enjoy the journey. So let's start here. This is, these are orbital trails of our planets and we have eight planets. Um, and you can see the little blue line here is Earth. And I'm showing you this to, to emphasize that there's a zone that we talk about, um, astrophysicists, astrobiologists talk about called the habitable zone. And that is a term used not to necessarily mean that life is on these planets, but it's the place where a planet resides near its star where liquid water could exist on its surface. And water is the key to life, water and carbon. Um, and so Earth is the only planet now that's in the habitable zone of our solar system. Here are eight planets. So it's this little zone right around Earth. And let's zoom in a little bit. So this is our, hab our habitable zone. Our planet's the only one squarely in the habitable zone. No, 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 no. Now Venus, which is here, and Mars, which is here, so we're actually, we think, in the habitable zone at one time. So what happened to these planets and why don't they support life now? And maybe we think one day we could go to a different planet to live. So we'll look at what happened on these planets to try to understand, number one, how to protect our planet from experiencing some of the devastating effects on other planets. And also, what would it mean to go to another planet that's not in the habitable zone anymore? Um, before I talk about habitability or just to take a little detour, I'm going to turn on a few of the asteroids. These asteroids, all of the asteroids in our solar system, these are the orbits of just a, th a few thousand asteroids called the potentially hazardous asteroids and they are between Mars and Jupiter. So here's Mars and here's Jupiter and here's Earth. And these are just the handful of asteroids that we can detect. So above 140 meters in diameter um, or uh, 140 meters in diameter that we can detect that cross Earth's path. And asteroids are important because they have led to some extinction events that could have led the way for us to exist. And um, they could have also delivered water to this planet, um, asteroids or comets, and as well as the ingredients for life. And so asteroids play a huge role in our existence, um, we think, in the solar system, as well as helped carve out an evolutionary path for us. Um, and we should also thank Jupiter right here, sorry, um, because Jupiter being so big has taken up a lot of the asteroids that could have hit us. Uh, both in the present day and also in the past. So asteroids are pretty cool, pretty important. Um, don't worry too much about getting hit by an asteroid anytime soon. Um, we are working on, or uh, astronomers and um, planetary scientists are working on creating better detection limits for asteroids so we could detect ones like the one that came over Russia in uh, 2013 that was too small at about 20 meters for us to detect. So to save our bandwidth, I'm going to turn these off and we're going to zoom in a little bit. And this is Earth Day, so let's start with Earth. And here we go. And I'm also, for uh, visuals, I'm going to, as soon as we will stop right here, as soon as we get to Earth, we'll go a little faster. 
Sorry again for the lagginess, but I assure you, if you download this, it'll look really nice. So Earth has actually a color layer on, and I am going to uh, turn that off. So let's see, I have to go to, um, sorry. Uh, I have to find my, so in open space, you can see that we have a menu bar here as I look for, uh, look for Earth. And I have to kind of find it here. There we go. No. All right. Well, in any case, I am going to turn on the um, satellites for now. Oh no. And uh, these satellites that you see that I'm that I'm turning on, and actually I'll zoom out a little bit. These satellites are uh, what give us all the information about the Earth's surface from space. And so we have uh, GPS satellites. Uh, geocentri in geocentric orbit, so they always have this, they don't need to be tracked by antennas because they always have the same view of the sky. And these are just a few of the satellites that um, are giving us information about the Earth's surface. And I'm gonna show you a few of that, uh, uh, just two data sets that we look at. Um, and it's kind of fun in open space to see where they are. So if I turn off the geocentric ones, you can see that we have ones in low Earth orbit as well. And you can zoom in a little farther and see these. Okay. Right now I have a chlorophyll layer turned on and I have to actually, sometimes you get a little lost. Oh, and one really important satellite, by the way, is the International Space Station, which orbits the Earth at about 16 times a day. And we have astronauts in permanent resonance or at least some astronauts, not one person <laughs> living up there all the time, but some astronauts uh, doing experiments and trying to figure out uh, the best uh, you, you're doing all this great science to eventually get us into space permanently as a human colony. So I just need to go to my uh, data sets, which I lost a little bit, and I'm sorry about that. Um, all right, I have to take a little. There we go. All right, so. Sorry, so this is a chlorophyll data set and actually I'll turn it off for a second. So this is Earth and we have um, great data sets of Earth. Uh, it, it Almost daily we get updates of Earth's uh, satellite data of Earth and really nice resolution of the surface. And it's not just to see houses or, um, or you know, we know that the surface of Earth looks like mountains and such, but it's also to get information that helps us understand the health of our biosphere and the health of our climate. And one such data set, and I'll turn this back on, is chlorophyll. And we may not think about chlorophyll very much, but of course, chlorophyll is part of plants and it's what takes up, it's, it's, part, it's a marker of plant life. And this is just the chlorophyll in the oceans. Um, these, this scale bar, essentially uh, blue, so if you follow the colors of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, red is highest and blue, purple are the lowest concentrations. And I'm showing you this just to, um, as a comparison, you can go to a NASA website to get the WorldView data set site to get these data sets and compare timeframes and really learn more about how scientists study this. But essentially chlorophyll is a really important marker and changes in chlorophyll in how much plant life is taking up carbon dioxide from our atmosphere and contri also contributing to oxygenation of the oceans. Um, taking up carbon dioxide is good because it helps us uh, take out some of the some of that greenhouse gas from our climate, but too much algae, too, or too much phytoplankton, too much chlorophyll, that indicates you can you can actually get algal blooms, which hurts the life in the oceans. And so there's a balance that has to be met. But chlorophyll is one way. Looking at changes in chlorophyll over time is one way that scientists uh, study the health of the biosphere and they import. Data, uh, these data sets into climate change models. All right, so we're going to turn off chlorophyll and turn on sea ice. Now, the sea ice data set uh, is concentrated at the polar regions, so we'll go towards the poles, and hopefully this is behaving. And again, the scale is the same, so you have red being highest and, um, and blue being lowest, essentially, and I'm just looking for it to load. It doesn't always behave for me. Let's see. It does take a second to load and we are streaming. So that could be part of it. But I'll just mention as it's as it's uh, loading up that the sea ice is also really important. Sea ice concentration for climate change models. It helps um, you can, uh, you know, of course, 
as the sea ice as sea ice melts, we know that um, with global warming, we're going to have less ice uh, around the poles and also in in glaciers, and um, and it can help. It helps us understand heat transfer because ice is very bright, has a what we call a high albedo, and with um, ice help, not enough ice being there, we can model try to understand heat transfer off of Earth. And unfortunately, let's see if it loaded. I really hope so. We'll zoom out a little bit. These data sets I want to emphasize are very large. <laughs> and sometimes we notice that, especially when we're loading these high resolution data sets, um, which are sometimes terabytes of data. My sea ice doesn't want to load. So what I'm going to do is go to my calendar here and see if I can get 2019's data set on there. And we'll only give it one second. And then we're going to move on to the next planet. But just remember, as we're considering Earth, this is our only habitable world now. We can't just hop over to Mars and set up a colony. Mars is not habitable at the moment. Um, and unfortunately, I think my sea ice is not. It's, it's a little slow right now, and it's probably not worth waiting. But essentially, what you see are concentrations of ice around the poles in these different colors that tell you um, how much is there and how it changes over time, because you can look at data sets over different years. You can kind of get a little sense. Let's see. Maybe not. I can see it's loading underneath, but we won't wait for it because we've got other places to go, people to see. So let's go on to Venus, which is sometimes called our sister planet or the toxic twin. Oops, why isn't it? Venus, there you are. And that is because Venus is really, really hot. And Venus is very interesting. I'm actually going to take these trails off. get in our way. This is the fun of navigation. Live navigation is always a lot of fun. So let's go on to Venus. Venus, hello. All right, here we go. And here it comes. Now, Venus is a really interesting planet, and the missions to Venus are fascinating. Um, Venus has, uh, Venus's atmosphere is about 100 times thicker than Earth's atmosphere. It's about 900 times the pressure, and it is about 100 times more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And what Venus experienced uh, a few, several billion years ago is what's called a runaway greenhouse. And this happened essentially because Venus is closer to the sun and its oceans were baked off. It, because of its location, all of its oceans and the, and the illumination from the sun they uh, evaporated into the atmosphere and water is a very strong greenhouse gas. And what happened to Venus is that it baked off all its oceans. You got a very, very thick, hot atmosphere. Venus could not, uh, because of the um, heat that built up on the surface of Venus, plate tectonics and the dryness of the surface, plate tectonics are what makes earthquakes stopped because you need water for that to, to keep going. And then you have all the CO2 then going into the atmosphere. So it's a combination of CO2, carbon dioxide, and water in Venus's atmosphere. There's no going back from Venus right now as far as um, become making it a habitable world. It's a really, there's uh, acid rain as well, so it's just not a fun place to visit. Um, one thing I'll mention in open space in the software is that the atmosphere is turned off a little bit so we can see the surface, but I'll turn it on. Oop. Whoop, that was the wrong slide. Sorry. <laughs> Where are my slides? Do I have to go back? I think I, um, you're getting a sneak preview there. There we go. That's what I want to show you. So Venus is atmosphere. This was um, imaged by Pioneer. Uh, the Pioneer mission was about decades ago. It is a very thick atmosphere. It can't, you can't see through it with normal uh, you know, optical wavelengths. Um, so it took a mission like Magellan, uh, are one of our missions to uh, uh, to image the surface with the high resolution data that we see in radar. But uh, one important mission that I'll bring up in a second is, are the uh, Venera probes by the uh, Russians who landed on Venus starting in 1961 and took really amazing um, images of the surface. So let's turn that off and go down. And what you see on Venus, there are um, there's active volca volcanoes on Venus. It has uh, really, the bright areas here are higher elevation. Um, we see evidence for volcano, for flowing uh, lava. And there are also impact craters from asteroids that come through. Um, they, so there would be big asteroids to make it through the atmosphere. 
Um, and and there are there's a lot of evidence for volcanism, volcanic craters, impact craters, and um, really interesting geology. You can fly around Venus, which is really fun. Uh, we don't have time to do that today, but you can zoom down and you can take a little journey around Venus. And keep in mind, we can't walk on this surface. We have no rovers on Venus. We can't go around the surface of Venus. Um, there is no life on Venus, for sure. Um, and under and above us, if we were on the surface, would be this crushing atmosphere. I will, uh, so let's look at some of these images, though. So the Venera mission took these amazing images of Venus's surface. And what they, of course, were interested in um, were, was, is there life on Venus? Just like we're interested in life on other planets we land on. Um, it, these missions, there were about uh, 10 probes that lasted on Venus. Um, and uh, because after that, they melted. And, um, and they lasted between 23 minutes and about two hours. And these are the images they took. Uh, so you can see it's, this was, um, it was, uh, these are Russian. So it was USSR actually at the time. Um, the temperature 490 degrees Celsius. So that's roughly, you know, 800, 900 degrees Fahrenheit, 1975. Um, and this is just uh, showing uh, from 1961 to 1984, these um, really amazing uh, images of the surface. And I say it's amazing because it's a real feat to be able to land on the surface and actually transmit data back. Um, back from the surface. So that's Venus. Um, and the only habitability on Venus possibly now is uh, in the upper atmosphere where there's water. And um, certainly there's no evidence that life is there, but there has been a discussion of uh, maybe setting up some kind of colony on Venus. Um, but that's really seems a little bit difficult to do at this point in time. So the last stop we're going to make today is Mars. And Mars is a wonderful planet to visit with open space because we have really high resolution data sets on Mars. Um, and you can explore the surface. You can activate what's called the high rise data set. And there are strips all over the planet. Um, these stripes here are the data sets where you can explore in great detail these canyons and, um, and, uh, and craters. And it's really pretty amazing. So Mars is the planet we think of when we're sending, we think of astronauts going to another planet and maybe one day living on Mars, although that'll take a long, long time to make possible from, any, uh, from a permanent perspective. So where, where, where will we go? Let's go to one place on Mars right now since this is a shorter, uh, a shorter program. And we're going to go to Warrego Vallis, which is a valley carved by precipitation and one of the uh, best lines of, evi of evidence that water existed on Mars. So it was warmer, it was wetter, and um, water existed on the surface. So let's find it. Here we go. It's actually in, it's at night now, so we're going to turn on the sun for it. And let's see, just change. Remember, if you, if you change a day to night on Venus, keep in mind that. Um, it, Venus's uh, day is about 243 Earth days, so you have to play around with that. And I'm trying to, oh, that's because I'm over here. Hello. It looks a little, my bookmark's a little. All right, so this is Veris Vallis, uh, or sorry, where we go Vallis, and it is a really interesting valley. So let's turn this off. Go back to zoom down here. And it's a series of channels that, uh, let's see, I'm going to, sorry, turn this, change this, and turn it back one more time to make sure I'm in the right spot, which I wasn't, so there I am. All right. So this is our, it looks a little bit like branches of a tree. Um, and I'm going to go back to Mars and navigate here. Oops. So for Mars, and we'll just, we'll, this will be our last stop. Uh, for Mars, Mars, it also has, is not habitable now, but it's got the opposite problem of Venus. It has too little atmosphere. And the reason it has too little atmosphere is that the sun has penetrated the atmosphere. It has no uh, magnetic field to protect it. So the sun has stripped off the atmosphere of Mars. So why? Is this a problem? Well, without an atmosphere, you can't support liquid water now. And we know that water flowed on Mars. This is just one example of how we know that. Uh, we can drive around 
Mount Morrigo Vallis, and you can zoom down even further. This is an impact crater. It's a really interesting area of Mars. And you can see it's actually, it was once thought to be a river valley, but they now know it's more evidence shows that it's from precipitation. So from um, water in the atmosphere. So if we, if we uh, decided to ever go to Mars and set up um, a human colony, how hard is that? Well, we have about 30% of the atmosphere and um, the gravity is, is very low. We can't breathe on Mars. It also has a CO2 atmosphere, but it's very, very thin, unlike Venus. Um, but there's a lot of discussion out there for people thinking really far in advance, uh, really far ahead uh, to thousands of years, perhaps, of what would terraforming Mars look like. And there's some really fun uh, uh, research articles you can read and just ideas about terraforming. But I'll show you a few pictures of what a city might look like. These are some, uh, some examples. These are, of course, artistic renderings of what a futuristic city on Mars might look like. You'd have to have these domes initially, but then if water, if you can sustain water and trees on the surface, then uh, Mars is habitable. Um, there's some uh, uh, research that uh, shows that this could never happen, or there's some speculation, I should say. So Elon Musk wants to terraform Mars, but uh, it looks like it's going to be harder than he says it's going to be. So we can't just use the ice caps, for example, to put water in the atmosphere. There's just not enough. So, but we hope eventually that maybe this could be our next planet to uh, live on, but it, it may take a very long time if, if it's possible at all. So we should remember that um, Earth is still and may be the only planet we could live on in the foreseeable future, at least for the longevity of our species and to keep that in mind. Um, but eventually maybe this could be us on Mars uh, with an ocean and no more spacesuits necessary. So um, who knows, but we'll develop the technology, hopefully keep developing technology to get us there. So that's all I have, uh, happy to take questions. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank you. Yay! <laughs> Clapping emojis in the chat, uh, raise hands emojis in the chat and planet emojis. And do try this, do try the sea ice, it does work. I don't know, my, my sometimes my uh, internet doesn't want it to. So. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's great that people can could go back and fly through the universe and visit the planet. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's not. It's everywhere. It's from Earth to the end of the visible universe. So there's a lot to explore. It's really fun. And you don't have to um, uh, worry about transmitting your signal elsewhere, like to you guys. But but that's fine. Happy to share. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so give us the, the link again. If people are interested. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's open openspaceproject.com. Space, open OpenSpaceProject.com. Yes, yes. You can get your Earth Day on with open space. <laughs> so uh, we did get some pretty good questions All right, in awesome. the chat. Uh, I'm going to go to YouTube with Chris Miller's question. Okay. Mars lost its atmosphere due to not having a strong magnetic field and solar wind. Venus doesn't have a strong magnetic field. Mm -hmm. Why is its atmosphere so thick? Right, so that's a great question. The comparison, they've, neither one has an intrinsic magnetic field. Um, but with Venus, what happened is that first the water baked off. So the oceans baked off into the atmosphere um, and that happened because it was so close to the sun. So you have an atmosphere full of water. When that happened, um, and, and so on earth, what happens is we get rain. And so we have a whole, um, our ecosystem, you know, the global ecosystem is able to control this for the most part, at least for water. Um, we certainly have the um, carbon emissions, our, our, the um, human-induced carbon emissions make this a little harder, but for water, we get rain coming down into our oceans. With Venus, there was so much water, uh, there's so much water in the atmosphere and it couldn't rain down, it was just too hot. And, um, and so all the oceans baked off into the atmosphere. And then what happened is that the, what's called the lithosphere, which is the top layer of the, um, it's, it's part of the surface. So we have a lithosphere as well, which is brittle, like peanut brittle. And so you get, that's how we get earthquakes is that you have like plates sliding next, sliding against one another um, with V and that helps control that takes in this, the carbon and, and, um, and puts it into carbonates into the ground. Venus doesn't have that. So the Venus is lithosphere uh, stopped being brittle, kind of hardened because there was no water 
anymore because that was all in the atmosphere. And then you had no carbon cycle anymore and all the carbon stayed in the atmosphere as CO2 instead of recycling back through the oceans and rain and into the, um, and into the, uh, the ground essentially. So that's what we have. We have a really uh, uh, great cycling of carbon through um, our oceans and rain and our plate tectonics. And so Venus just lost that ability due to um, the uh, proximity of the sun baking off the oceans and then that cycle, that kind of runaway cycle. More questions. Uh, <laughs> Eric wants to know, well, we'll see about this one. If one of our <laughs> Mars rovers found a verifiable fossil on Mars, what would our response be? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, we, chaos, I don't know, anything from excitement to chaos, I imagine. But so if we found any sign of life, past life or present life, whether it's microbial or a little alien who walks into hopefully my office, um, <laughs> that will be proof that um, we are not alone. And so you'd have to make sure it's not a contaminant and all of this. But if you if this was provable, it would show that life is common because we'd have two instances very close together, us and whatever it is, that uh, show that there's that that would statistically mean life is common. And that means we're not alone in the universe. So to me, it's remarkable and amazing. What we do with that information as humans is up to, you know, we, we wonder, right? I, you know, we discover new species on earth and they don't survive sometimes even to be discovered. Uh, so the ones that, you know, we hear about, um, rainforest destruction, killing species that never get a chance to even be discovered. So we discover some, they disappear, we don't discover a lot. And so who knows if we'll change that approach if we discover other life, but it would mean we're not alone and that's pretty fundamental, so. Wow, yeah, that would, do you think they would celebrate Mars Day? They should, we should already have a Mars Day. We should have a day for every planet. Should we, we could, <laughs> we could, we could. Saturday. Uh, yeah. Jupiter. Oh, you mean the week, the day of the week or oh, the <laughs> well, annual just... Mars Day? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I think we've got time for one. This question came up early. Uh, this one's from Facebook. Is the Atlas comet really five times the size of Jupiter? What would happen if it slammed into the sun? So is that a comet? I'm not familiar with that particular comet. Um, is okay. that a comet that just came around or something? I think somebody just maybe heard about it and was interested. Okay, so if it slammed into the sun, it's gone and we don't have to worry about it. Um, the sun will just, it burns up before, it will burn up well before it ever reached the sun. Um, but I mean, we we can't, we couldn't detect, so if you're worried about impacts um, and we could, we could just, you know, you could think about what do we do if we know an asteroid's coming or a comet, there's not a lot we can do right now. We don't want to blow it up because when you blow something up, you get a million, little tiny pieces of that thing so you don't want that to happen um and uh you know we think about our ability we can think of ideas but our ability to carry out the ideas um is, is uh not we're not able i think to deflect uh an asteroid that uh wants to hit us or that is coming towards us or a comet if we colonize mars mm. how will we get pizza delivered <laughs> you're going to 3D print your pizza. This is what I actually think um, is that 3D printing is so amazing that you're going to throw my, I mean, we should be able to extract everything we want from like the dirt on Mars. So you could, I would hope you could throw dirt in a 3D printer and outcomes, whatever you want, pizza, granola bar, whatever, you know, ice cream. I don't know. But okay, yeah, I mean, okay. I think you're going to 3D print your pizza. So look forward to that. <laughs> 3D printed pizza. Okay. Yeah. Well, they actually are 3D printing food now. I mean, there are examples of that. I don't know if they're sophisticated. Like you come out with a bowl of spaghetti with all of the nice condiments laid out on top of maybe like a bowl of mushed up stuff, but they're getting there. And I think that you can 3D print simple things and I'm sure it's going to come along. Um, so yeah, I think 3D printing is going to be a big part of colonizing Mars. All right. Well, Rachel, Thank you Thank so you. much for helping us celebrate Earth Day. Oh, you are so welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to see you Friday. We will see you Friday right. noon, everybody, here on the museum's YouTube channel. Uh, this Friday is the 30th anniversary for the Hubble Space Telescope. So Dr. Rachel Smith and the assistant head of the Astronomy Lab, Dr. Patrick Troithart, are both going to join us at noon to talk about the discoveries that Hubble has helped us make. from stars and planets, 
all the way out to galaxies. So yeah. All right. You then. Thank you. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye Rachel. And I think I got a glimpse of our nature fairy. Fonzie. Hi Chris. How are you? I'm doing great. It's Earth Day. What a great day is today. Happy Earth Day. Thank you so much for joining our streamathon here with the Museum of Natural Sciences. What have you been up to? Well, Chris, I have been flying around. It's been amazing, but I am one third human, and that means that I am following the human laws as well. Um, so I am staying at home in my human home, spending some time away from my hollow tree. Um, well, I'm very glad you're staying healthy and staying safe. So, oh, what do you have to say to people? Well, um, today I am here to talk about uh, connect with nature while you're still at. You can connect with nature um, right from today. All right, screen. If I can figure out how to do it. Magic fairy wand to do that? Be a little better at doing it than I am now. Well, goodness, I can't figure it out. This is why I live in a hollow tree, Chris. Chris. The Wi-Fi in the hollow tree. That's right. Um, so I'll just introduce you all to myself. Um, my name is Hales. When I am an, a human being, I am a gallery programs coordinator at the Virginia Aquarium and Marine Science Center in Virginia Beach, Virginia critters and trees and squirrels and things like that. One third human, so along with Gary, which you can see here, once in a while at the aquarium, you can catch me being a crocodile and a shark you're gonna get. Um, and I wear many different hats and flower crowns. Uh, a little bit about how to engage, engage with kiddos in nature in the summers lead a lot of pro I do what we call whimsy Wednesdays where we are outside a flower garden and um, we are engaging lots of things that you could do right at home so I'd like to talk a little bit about some of that you can do on Earth Day and every day uh, so the first is egg cartons a lot so what you can do with egg of upcycling and a creative because we're not going to go out and buy a lockets or shovels and things like that. So carton at home. What I have done is nature treasure. You use each space in the egg carton find outside. So my very favorite, I love moss, um, my um, but I find and some really cool and an egg carton is a great way for out some of their nature treasures. <laughs> find some cool things. They don't even have to know why one of my favorites, they come from pine trees, delightful. So for fairies, we don't really find lots of pirate treasure or golden us are things that we can find out to make us happy. So for me, my treasure burns, but hey, you may like um, gumballs, you may like connect with is a nature treasure. So and make a nature. Adults, you can go outside and make a new hunt. So ask your kids to use the nature box with the same things as yours or outside and really engage in nature. So that's one of the things that I have. Another thing that I have um, that I personally love to do is collecting different shaped leaves. So I go outside on the nature trail at the Virginia Aquarium. We have a ton of incredible native trees. Um, I found out recently that oak trees support 532 native species of bugs. Um, and an oak tree is where I live. Uh, so I go out and I find oak leaves, I find maple leaves, and what I do with kids, and I wish I could share my screen. If only I were tech savvy, I would do that. Um, but what I do is I like to find all the different kinds of leaves that I can find. Um, and compare and contrast, find leaves on the ground and try to look up and find the tree that it belongs to. That can be hours of fun. And I do that with kids all the time in the summers. Um, some other things to do if you're able to go outside is nature journaling. Sit in a spot for a long time and just see what kinds of 
animals or plants are around, draw what you find, write down what you see. Making observations, especially in the same place every day, is a really great way to connect with your environment. And fun fact, you can do nature journaling inside too. You can sit at your window and see what you can see if you don't have an um, outside space that you can access safely. Another thing that has been my personal favorite is I have been gardening quite a lot. I recently started my own compost bin and I am finding mystery plants in my compost bin. So this plant came straight from the compost bin. It was a seed. I think it could have been a pumpkin or a butternut squash. And I'm gonna find out probably in a couple months. So this is one that I'm really excited about. I'm going to plant it in my garden soon. Um, and I have a few other things that I'm planting inside. Here are some carrots that are growing and I'm starting out my garden inside, but I'm gonna move it outside soon. One of the other things that um, I love to plant in my garden are native plants. Like I said, oak trees support 532 species of animals, um, whereas a non-native butterfly bush supports one species of animal. Um, so I like to plant native plants. Um, I'm currently getting ready to plant some milkweed seeds so I can see some butterflies in my backyard um, and other plants that are really great for pollinators in my area. Now, speaking of my new oak tree fun fact, um, one of the things that I did the other day that I haven't tried out with other people, but I'd be interested to find out so that you all can do science at home is I went outside and I sat next to a tree and I counted every single animal and bug that I found on that tree, all of the different ones that I could find. It was a lot. It wasn't quite 532, but it was a lot. Um, and I started making notes of which tree I was looking at and how many bugs and birds I could find on that one tree. Um, and so I am creating my own nature journal that is going to help me find cool animals in the future. Now, I do also want to be fair to the people who can't quite go outside. Um, there are some people who are uh, isolating in indoor spaces or in apartment complexes in urban areas. And even though you can't go outside and enjoy nature right in your backyard, there are so many things that you could do right inside. So like I said a minute ago, I have been making a windowsill garden. I have some seeds, but um, you can make windowsill gardens out of the vegetables that you get rid of. Um, you can plant the base of romaine lettuce and grow your own romaine lettuce inside. Um, I have been growing cilantro. And one of the things that I've been doing in my indoor garden is I am upcycling. So I don't have the prettiest pots for my plants, but I am using what I can find. So I found a Greek yogurt container. I found a coffee bag. And my carrots are currently living in a strip waffle container. Um, and all of these things are amazing because like I said, we can't really go out and buy products. Um, so we're gonna use what we can find in our own homes. So I encourage you all to um, upcycle and do what you can. One of the, my favorite ways to upcycle is in my other egg carton. Get ready for this. I found out recently that you can start seeds inside of eggshells. I know. Um, so you can start seeds inside of eggshells, um, grow your seeds into little seedlings, and as soon as they're ready to go into your garden, you can crush up that egg and plant it right in the garden. Um, and all that extra eggshell is going to be really nutritious for your plants that are growing, and it's gonna provide fertilizer and also um, detract from the bugs that could be eating your plants. So I have been getting ready to plant my milkweed inside of all of my little eggshells so that I can have plants that are ready to go in my garden later.
let's see what else there is. Oh, while you're planting seeds, um, if you happen to have indoor plants, you might see my very long tendrilly plant behind me. If I can get my wings out of the way, that is a pothos plant. It's a very common house plant. And I have been propagating my pothos plant. So what I've been doing is I've been snipping some of those tendrils, placing them in water and watching roots grow. And then as soon as the roots have grown about that much, I place them in dirt. And my pothos plant has already been giving me new leaves. So those are a few things that you can do from inside. I also have a bird feeder and some other really fun um, things that help me to engage with nature while I'm still inside. And that's about what I have for you all today. Do you have... Thank you so much, Chris. Hales, this, was, this has been amazing. Hales, Tanzi, the fairy, mermaid Hales. <laughs> All three. All three. No, this is fantastic. So many great ways for people to get involved and connected with nature uh, in even the smallest of ways so that uh, they can get the benefits of nature and gain an appreciation for how great the planet really is. Absolutely. And the best thing about engaging with nature is you don't have to be an expert on your place. I live outside and I still don't know the names of all the birds and the bugs and I still love it and engage with it and I'm learning every day. I think that's a great, great message. Awesome. And I could not be more appreciative of you joining our, the, our museum's Earth Day Streamathon, bringing a little bit of Virginia Aquarium down uh, closer to Raleigh, North Carolina. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me on, Chris. So if people wanted to find out more about the kind of work that you do, how could they do that? Absolutely. So if you are interested in finding out more about the Virginia Aquarium and what the Virginia Aquarium is doing, you can find them on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and on their website, virginiaaquarium.com. Um, and if you're interested in finding out more about what I do, you can find me on any of the social platforms at mermaid underscore Hales, and Hales is spelled H-A-L-E-S. Thank you so much, and happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. So great to see you. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Oh my gosh. We've had, we've barely just got started in our Earth Day streamathon, everybody. Only just got started. And we've already learned so many incredible things. We've learned about wildlife in the 19th and early 20th century in the US and conservation movements compared to what we see happening in other parts of the world and how the current coronavirus uh, events can, what might be leading us towards a new sort of conservation ethic in some other parts of the world. Uh, we just heard from Hales at the Virginia Aquarium about ways that you can get involved with and interested in nature and even the smallest of ways, like planting seeds in broken eggshells. That's a lot of fun. Uh, and then of course, Dr. Rachel Smith took us on a tour of the inner solar system to talk about how special and unique Earth really is. So I hope you're enjoying the streamathon so far. It looks like our next guest is fired up and ready to go. Hannah, are you there? Are you with us, Hannah? I am. Looks Hi, like. how are you? I am great. How are you doing? It's Earth Day. I'm doing great. It's Earth Day. It's great. I didn't expect to be following a fairy ever in my life, but here we are. <laughs> you know, um, let me. I don't, I don't think most of us. Yeah. Most of us ever really do. Yeah, but. All right. On let's Earth see. Day, anything could happen. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, and... it's one of the most special days. Of, of the year is Earth Day. Yeah, loved all the advice she gave. I've been uh, checking my garden each day for earth or for some earth snakes that live in my flower bed. Ooh, yeah, I found two this year so far. Yeah, yeah, I found I found four snakes yesterday. So the good day for me. <laughs> well, everybody, let me introduce you to Hannah Reynolds. Hannah is with the North Carolina State University Turtle Rescue Team. And so I think we're going to learn a little bit about what the turtle rescue team does and how they're working to understand and protect species. 
Hannah, I'll let you take it away. All right. Hey, um, I can't tell if the screen is working, but let's see. Oh, it's not. Yeah, it looks right. great. Awesome. All right. So I'm Hannah. Like you said, I am with North Carolina State's Turtle Rescue Team. I am actually a DVM PhD candidate there. And I'm just going to tell you a little about, about Turtle Rescue Team and about a very special turtle named Funfetti, one of our success stories from 2019. So we are a veterinary student run organization. Um, and so the key there being veterinary student run. And so we are all full time students. And our goal is to provide high quality medical and rehabilitation services to injured wild reptiles and amphibians, uh, with the goal being to return them to their natural habitats. Um, Dr. Kays earlier spoke a little bit about how turtles have these longer lifespans um, and slower reproductive cycles. And so one of the things that we try to do is help make sure that all the ways that humans are harming turtles, they get hit by cars, lawnmowers, all sorts of things, that these turtles can maybe make, have a chance to make it back to the environment and be reproductively active. Um, so we try to do public outreach as a part of that, train veterinary students. We get a lot of hands-on experience as well. And we also do a lot of research. So these are some of our success cases, um, a clutch of baby turtles that we hatched out this year. And then this was a turtle named Bean on his release day. And so when we're talking about turtle rescue team, what do we primarily see? Um, so we live in North Carolina, right? Over 50% of our cases are eastern box turtles, the North Carolina state reptile. Um, you've probably seen these if you've looked around your backyard hard enough or in the forest or something, you probably see these. One of the reasons that we think we see box turtles so much is because as opposed to most of the other turtle species in North Carolina, these are turtles that are primarily moving on land and around on land. They're not aquatic turtle species. So their whole life cycle is spent on land versus the other turtles, which are water turtles. And so they're only really getting out of the water if they're trying to breed. 16.3% um, of our cases are yellow-bellied sliders. These are the ones, if you go, I love to go to Lake Johnson and walk around. These guys will be out sunning on the logs on a really nice sunny day. We also see cooters, which are very hard to distinguish from yellow-bellied sliders, but you get good at it with practice. And about 10% of our patients, a little under, are common snapping turtles. Uh, a bunch of people, everyone calls us and says, hey, I have an alligator snapping turtle. And if you're in the state of North Carolina, it is actually a common snapping turtle. We do not have alligator snapping turtles. They get much bigger. Um, if you've gone to the museum, you've probably seen the um, state record snapping turtle lives there. And last time I actually got to be involved in his last appointment and he was over 70 pounds. Uh, about 5% of our turtles are Eastern painted turtles. And then we see about 6% other species. This includes the spotted turtle, which is an endangered species in North Carolina. And we will also see any other injured reptile or amphibian provided it is not venomous. Um, and then these are kind of the causes or why we're seeing these patients. 82% um, are coming in for some sort of trauma. So the large majority of our patients come in for some sort of trauma. 10% are coming in for infectious diseases of various sorts. Um, these, uh, if you see at the top, that's what we call an oral abscess or an ear abscess. Um, turtles get these a lot. We think it's because of some pollutants in the water now have made them more prone, have depleted a vitamin that's necessary for them and made them more prone to these infections. And then we'll see viral infections. So it's not a coronavirus, but they will get an upper respiratory infection, as you can see in that lower left photo. Um, and then sometimes they'll have infections. They'll get their eyes will get swollen. And then 3.5% of the turtles we see each year are actually healthy turtles that someone saw and thought was injured and brought to us. Um, so those are pretty easy cases. Um, is it gonna flip? And then another 4% are not easily classifiable. This was an interesting case we got in this year. Um, and this was a squamous cell carcinoma. So this turtle actually had a cancer that was in its leg and had also invaded into its liver and was metastatic. Um, so this was actually, when, when we got this turtle in, it had never been reported to have metastatic disease in one of these turtles. And then when we worked this turtle up, by the time we had finished, that was published in another turtle. So this is the second case of this in North America. Um, and then of the trauma patients we're seeing, uh, I think that most people can guess this, uh, 63% are hit by a car, 7.6%, we don't really know what happened. This one, I think, was a boat propeller is our best guess. 
Uh, dog attacks, we call this the CBD that's chewed by a dog. And these come in somewhat frequently. Lawnmower accidents are common as well. I try to, I want people to, if you're going to mow your lawn, try to keep it mowed low enough all the time such that there's not a risk that you're gonna hit a turtle because you've let it get so tall. You don't wanna be harming wildlife in that process. Uh, fishing hooks is another common thing we get. Uh, turtles eat fish as well, and so they're prone to biting the same hooks that do that the fish that you're trying to catch will bite. And then we'll see other animal attacks. This wasn't a turtle, this was a green anole actually, but this one was brought into us after a neighborhood cat had gotten it. And he actually perked up real well and was released about a week later. And so if you wanted to call us, let's say you find a turtle and you wanted to know what happens to it, this, I'm just gonna walk you through kind of our process. So we have a veterinary student on call 12 hours a day, 365 days a year. So from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., if someone finds a turtle, they are welcome to bring it to us, call us and bring it in. And then when you bring it to us, the student will meet you and perform an exam and create a treatment plan. So this was a turtle I got last year named Cookie Dough. And so this is what he looked like when I got him. And by the end of the day, this is what he looked like because I performed what's known as a shell repair surgery. And then the patient stays with us while it needs its medical care. At which point, because turtles, unlike humans, they take a lot longer to heal, um, and they have, they're cold-blooded or ectothermic animals, so they have a slower metabolism. And so that means that these injuries take a long time to heal. And because we're seeing over 500 cases a year, it's just not feasible for us to keep these patients in our hospital until they're ready to go back to the wild. Because as you'll see, when I talk about funfetti, some of these patients are staying with us for up to um, 11 months a year at times. And so we have a dedicated team of volunteers that we couldn't do this without. And these people are rehabilitators. So they keep these turtles in their homes and take care of them day to day when they don't need active medications and while they're healing and recuperating and getting ready to go back out to the wild. And then they'll receive regular checkups with students and faculty at NCSU. And then when they're ready and cleared for release, we will release them. And this was Cookie Dough escaping when we knew he was ready to be released. He was an escape artist. I got many complaints from professors and other members of the hospital who found him where he was not supposed to be. And then they get to be released. And one of the things that I love about this organization that I love about working with it is we try and we always try to get the person who found the turtle to release the turtle if they're willing to. And that way we know they're going back to their where they came from as close as possible. And then the person gets to know, like, I really helped this turtle out, and now it gets to go back into the wild. So that's a really fun part of the project. So a few more statistics from us. Um, 2019 was our record year. We saw well over 550 cases. I think it was 584 was the number. Um, and so any turtle that walks in the door with us, approximately 50% of those turtles are successfully returned to the wild. And if a turtle lives for 24 hours, we go up to about a 66% chance. And if a turtle lives a week, 90% of those make it back to the wild. We also are able to salvage eggs. So a lot of the water turtles, if they get hit by a car, what they've been doing is it's females that are on their way to lay eggs or it's males on their way to try to find a female. Um, and so there are some of those cases that unfortunately the female does not survive, but we have successfully pulled eggs from those females and hatched them. So this was a clutch of about, I think we got 20 eggs there, 19 eggs. Um, and I think 18 of them hatched or something. We called these, last year our naming theme was food, and these were the Bowberry Biscuits from Bojangles is what we called that clutch. Um, and then they were just the cutest little things. And so now I'm gonna talk to you about Funfetti. Funfetti was a really cool case that we had this year. Um, he was, each year there's always a favorite case, um, and Funfetti was definitely the case this year. I just want to do a quick uh, shout out to people who were very actively involved in his case. Um, on the left in this photo is Dr. Ashley Kirby. She is our turtle team intern this year, um, and she's been amazing. She's, it's the first time that we've had a full-time veterinarian working with our staff. So Dr. Kirby graduated from NC State's College of Veterinary Medicine in 2017, 2018, and joined us in 20. 19 to take care of our turtles and help us and she's actually got a really cool job lined up for next year She'll be going to Alaska to work at their marine mammal center and then um, Jacqueline Dillard is one of our vice presidents. She's the blonde next to me 
Um, she was helping us with funfetti on that day, and she's one of our very dedicated volunteers. And then on the far right, the hero of Turtle Rescue Team is the one, the only, Dr. Gregory Lubart. He, this organization was his idea. He founded it, and he's been guiding us ever since. Um, and it's been around since 1996. So we've been been here a while, 20, 24 years. So Funfetti was one that was brought to us on April 27th of 2019, so almost exactly a year ago. And when he came into us, um, another rescue organization called Be Wild, um, a local reptile rescue, had found him. And this was a pretty old looking injury. And that's actually a pretty common thing we see with snapping turtles. I think because people are less willing to pick them up, maybe. We're not really sure, but when we get snapping turtles in, those injuries tend to be a little bit older. Um, and so this is what he looked like. Um, Brandy Clark, a member of the veterinary school, was the student who took him in that day. And so he, we, she cleaned him up, started him. We do give them antibiotics, pain medications, um, and then we'll do a fracture repair surgery if it's necessary. And so we took care of him. He was doing great, went to a rehab home. And then his rehabber brought him back to us because she was concerned. And so he came back to us and it just, the tissue wasn't looking right. So we cleaned it up. And when we cleaned it up, it's, it's a little hard to see, but we realized that this turtle, it looked like he'd actually broken his spine. And this is where this case got really interesting to us. Um, and very, it became a very special case because this turtle had a broken spine and yet was able to walk and move all four of his limbs. And if you know much about spinal cords, that's not normal. And so we were like, what's going on? So we actually got to do something pretty cool. It's nice when you are at a veterinary school. We, we hauled him across campus and took him to get a CT scan. And so if you've ever wondered what it looks like when you put a turtle in a CT machine, this is it. So this was Funfetti getting his CT scan. And the radiologist did confirm for us that Funfetti had a severed spinal cord. And despite that, normally you would expect a lot of problems associated with that. It, they'd have trouble walking. They might have trouble pooping or peeing. But despite this, Fun Betty was just fine. So we decided to keep handling this case and see what we could do. Um, but we didn't want to release him just yet because of these problems he was having. Um, and we wanted him to be healed up a little better before we released him. So this was in October, just showing how these cases can go on for a while, right? He came in and in April, and this is October, so this is six months later. Um, he actually got to star in a promotional video for NCSU, so you got some behind the scenes shots of that, and he became famous. You can see from his face, he's very pleased about that. Um, and we've got Christian Capobianco, one of our president elects, was debriding that wound. And if you look in that bottom right photo, you can see what we call epithelialization, um, which just means that he's got new skin growing in there um, and new it'll eventually turn into bone. So a turtle shell is actually made of bone and then it's covered in a layer that's like keratin, very similar to our fingernails. And turtles are the only animals on earth that have their shoulder blades and their ribs totally covered by bones and have their organs inside this outer layer of bone like that. So it was epithelializing and healing well, but we don't like to release turtles that late in the year because it's starting to get colder and Turtles, like I said, they're cold-blooded or ectothermic animals, and so they're a lot less lower activity in the cold, and we were just fearful. We don't like releasing them in that time of year because they might, that's when they tend to do, they don't hibernate, it's not the word for it, but they do what's called brumation, which is where they're very low activity, and we don't think that it's good practice to release a turtle in that state or that time of year. Unfortunately, though, at this point in time, we were undergoing renovations and did not have room to keep him. And he was a feisty boy, and we didn't have a lot of rehabbers who wanted to keep him. Um, if anyone is interested in rehabbing snapping turtles, we will take you in a heartbeat. These are the hardest ones to find rehab homes for. But thankfully, um, the museum actually stepped up for Funfetti, and Dr. Dombrowski and Shane from Veterinary Services uh, said that they would let him come stay there. So Fun Betty got to spend his winter at the museum where he got a much bigger, nicer tank than what he would have had with us. And he continued to heal and progress. And basically, this is how he would look at you every day when you walked in there because he wanted food. Uh, 
He was a hungry, hungry boy. Um, and so then in March, it was warming up, as we all know. Um, and so we got to do our pre-release examination. And as you can see there, that injury had healed quite a bit. The fracture was much more solid. It wasn't moving around and stuff. And at this point in time, we decided that we thought he was re ready for release. Um, so we've got a nice layer there protecting the injury, the, his solomic cavity, which is like a turtle's abdominal cavity. Um, is all closed in and he was active, we, what we call BAR or bright alert responsive. And so we were ready to release Funfetti. And so this is when he got released. Um, I tried to put a video in, but I, that's where my PowerPoint level stopped today. Um, and he went home. We unfortunately, Dr. Kirby was like, I forgot to remove the tape. But so he got to go back to his home and he does have a piece of tape on him. I'm not sure where he's released, but if you see a large snapping turtle with a crash shell and a piece of tape, it's probably Funfetti. Um, and what we did do while he was at the museum, we actually placed a pit tag is what we call it, but it's just a microchip. It's the same sort of thing that your dog or your cat has for if they get lost. So if anyone ever finds Funfetti in the future or he comes in for another reason, we will be able to actually scan him and say, this is our turtle. Um, so that's just kind of a basic overview of our turtle rescue team and just one of our successful cases. Um, like I said, we're seeing about 500 cases a year right now. It is a little COVID-19 has impacted us some, so it's all unfortunately right now. We've kind of got vet students handling the phone calls, but the doctors are the only ones really on campus right now seeing the patients. Um, so if you have to call us, please be patient with us because it's not, it's not the same as normal. Um, but if you want to get involved with Turtle Rescue Team in any way, you can follow us on social media. Um, all that is there. And if you're interested in becoming a rehabber, uh, please just shoot us an email. I check it every day and would be happy to get back to you. I also field questions. I've been getting a lot of questions, I think, because people are out in their yards doing work and they're finding turtles that are perfectly healthy and asking me what's wrong with them. Um, and then if you find a turtle that needs help, you can always call us on our pager. Um, and with that, if anyone has questions, I'd be happy to ask or answer them. Thank you very much, Hannah. I am so glad that there are people here in the Triangle taking care of the turtles. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. And it's great to see and hear stories of, you know, conservation action happening, you know, for us at the museum right down the road and for residents here in North Carolina, you know, not that far away. It's happening right here. Yeah, yeah, no, it's great. And it's it's when you like really think about like this year we got I think 250 plus turtles released back into the wild and like box turtles for example can live up to the oldest known one was 138 years old. So a lot of these patients we're seeing it just like takes my breath away sometimes like I'll see a turtle and be like this thing is like has been on this earth way longer than I have. Um and because of that it's just their population numbers won't recover as much if they they go down and it takes a lot long to have a live. So we did get a question that came in for you. All uh, right. Shreya wants to know, how do you name the turtles? Oh, that is a great question. So each year the vet students vote on a naming theme and then they all get a name based on that theme. So our 2019 theme, if you could guess, was, pro was food. Um, our 2020 theme this year, we're doing nature, but it's not allowed to be animals. Uh, 2018 was actually animals, which was very confusing. <laughs> um, and then there was someone who liked to name all of her animals things that were also food and would like, there's obviously some overlap. And so then you would try to, like, I love asking, especially when kids bring a turtle in, if they have a name that fits the theme. So one kid, we asked him what his favorite food was and he said spaghetti and we were like, oh, we already had a spaghetti. And then he goes lobster. So we had a lobster last year, um, high taste to do. Uh, occasionally we will have another name for a turtle if it's special. Cool. Uh, uh, one more question. Uh, we'll do this one quickly because I want to get to our next guest. When you hatch the baby turtles, uh, when you collect the eggs, mm -hmm. how long do you keep them before releasing? Uh, we don't keep them very long, generally under a week. So turtles actually, if you ever look at one upside down, they have a belly button. It's very hard to see, uh, but they do. Um, and it's where their yolk sac was. So when they're in the shell, they have the yolk. And then they, when they hatch, there's a little bitty yolk there. 
um, that's still there. And that provides them food for the first few days of their life. And once that has fully resorbed, that's when we think that they're ready to go back to be released in the wild, um, just because that is a little prone to injury. Okay, okay. Well, happy Earth Day. Thanks happy for Earth being Day. Here again. Yeah, no problem. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks for the great work that you're doing. Uh, yeah, thank you. Everybody, check out Turtle Rescue Team with the College of Veterinary Medicine at North Carolina State University. Hannah, thanks. Thanks. happy Earth Day. All right, happy Earth Day. All right, everybody. Well, we're having a great time here at the Earth Day Streamathon, brought to you by the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Uh, it's brought to you by us, but I had a lot of help as well. Folks from the North Carolina Sea Grant, North Carolina Space Grant, Water Resources Research Institute, the North Carolina Office of Environment. It really was a team effort to bring this show together. Behind the scenes right now, there are staff who are helping me run this whole program and keep everything going. So many thanks to them. Uh, much kudos to everybody at the museum as well who's helped put on our streamathon. We're celebrating Earth. No, this one. Uh, that looks like a poor beagle. Oh, I tried to throw a tricky one. I thought this would be a tricky shark. How do you know a poor beagle from like a, a white shark? Uh, poor beagles are a little bit stouter. Their eyes are bigger. Um, if you get a look at the teeth, their teeth are a lot skinnier than a white shark's too. Oh, okay. Wow. You had that one right off the bat. And this one. Oh, mega mouth. Mega mouth. I, this, this is kind of a derpy shark in my opinion, but I love it. They are pretty adorably derpy. Not quite as derpy as basking sharks, though. Not quite a, like that one? Yep, like that one. Now, you knew this. I didn't even share this quiz with you. This is incredible. Probably could guess that out of the strange sharks, maybe basking shark would be in the lineup. They look even derpier with their mouths closed. <laughs> like a big, flat, uh, smiley face, right? Yeah, they look like the like neutral face emoji, basically. <laughs> Well, let's jump in. I won't hold the presentation up anymore. Everybody, shark expert, Dr. Chuck Bangley. All right. Guess I can go ahead and share screen. And... Looks good. Everybody sees that? Fantastic. Great. All right. Um, thank you, Chris, for, uh, for inviting me. Um, it's good to be here uh, virtually at the North Carolina Museum of Science um, for Earth Day's 50th anniversary. As I mentioned before, I used to be uh, a resident of North Carolina. I went to grad school at East Carolina University. Now I'm based up in Maryland at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, um, tagging sharks all over the East Coast, basically, and they keep coming back to North Carolina. Um, so I just can't get away, apparently. Um, which is a good thing because North Carolina is actually a real shark biodiversity hotspot. When people think of hotspots for sharks, they tend to think of places like Florida or Australia. Um, but in my fairly biased opinion, uh, North Carolina has got them all beat. Uh, North Carolina has got small sharks like this Atlantic sharp nose in the top left. It's got big sharks like that great hammerhead. Um, it's got some unusual sharks like that thresher there with the elongated tail that it actually can swing around in front of its head and smack fish. Um, so North Carolina has quite the, uh, the diversity of sharks, and we'll go into some of the reasons why that might be. Um, but first, looking back into the, uh, the history of sharks, and sharks have been um, in North Carolina fossil record for as long as there have been sharks. Um, so this, uh, this little timeline goes back to the beginning of the Jurassic period. But if we go back even further than that, um, the first members of the class chondrichthys, uh, which is the group of cartilaginous fish, basically they have cartilage for their skeleton, the same kind of material that the end of your nose, your earlobes would be made out of. Um, they have that for a skeleton instead of true bone. And the first animals in this group started showing up in the fossil record around the Devonian period, about 400 to 350 million years ago. Um, the first kind of recognizable chondrichthian fossils actually show up around the same time that fish started evolving jaws. Uh, so there's potential, there potentially been something related to sharks 
um, for as long as fish have been able to bite things. Um, moving forward in time, uh, from the Triassic to the Cretaceous period, you had the dinosaurs and other large marine reptiles, which is all well and good. That's fun. Um, but this is also the time period that many of our modern sharks uh, started showing up. So the squaliforms, which are our modern dogfish sharks, uh, the lamniforms, which is the group that includes the, uh, the poor beagle we saw during the quiz, um, as well as great whites, makos, and the thresher sharks, um, and the carcarhinoforms, which can, can uh, include a, uh, a lot of familiar species um, like sandbar sharks, dusky sharks, and all the reef shark species. Um, and then we move forward in time a little bit to uh, the era of the most famous extinct shark of all, um, Carcharodon or Carcharocles or Odotus, depending on which paleontologist you're talking to, um, Megalodon. The, uh, the 50 foot white shark relative that used to terrorize whales and actually was fairly common um, in an inland sea that covered a lot of Eastern North Carolina. Um, interestingly, uh, this tooth that's pictured here is not a megalodon tooth, but it comes from the same kind of deposits that you'd find megalodon teeth in. So if you live in Eastern North Carolina, you can uh, dr take a drive down to Aurora once we're able to uh, go out in public again. Um, and there's a fossil museum there uh, where you can actually get a look at some of these fossil shark's teeth. And a number of those fossils are modern species, species that are still around right now. So five million years ago, there was, there was megalodon, but there were also modern hammerheads and thresher sharks and dusky sharks and tiger sharks. These really recognizable modern species have been around at least that long. And then you get uh, to real recently in uh, geological time, and then there's us. Um, so we've been on Earth about a fraction, a fraction of the time that uh, sharks have been around. Um, sharks are classically thought to fulfill this apex predator uh, role in marine ecosystems. Um, and the, uh, this role, their, their role as apex predators actually has a lot to do with both them directly eating their prey and them scaring their prey. Um, so this is based off of uh, work in Australia in a place that's aptly named Shark Bay. Um, where there is basically a sharky season during which these large tiger sharks are patrolling around in this shallow seagrass bed area um, and a non-sharky season. And the researchers working out there have found that large grazing animals like sea turtles and dugongs, which are basically the Australian manatee, um, and also uh, smaller lower level predators like dolphins, smaller sharks, uh, rays, and large fish, um, during basically the shark season, uh, those prey species use their habitat a lot differently um, than they do when the sharks are not around. You'll see sea turtles, dolphins, smaller sharks avoiding actually shallower areas where there are fewer escape routes from tiger sharks. Um, and these areas that tiger sharks are basically scaring animals away from, um, you see a, a much denser and more diverse seagrass growth, uh, which in turn makes better habitat for the juvenile fish that would normally be getting eaten by those lower level predators. Um, so these big sharks can actually help structure the whole ecosystem in a way that helps levels of the food web that are much lower than themselves. Uh, sharks also have a long human history in uh, North Carolina. Um, they've been fairly important for fisheries. North Carolina is a uh, relatively good player in the, uh, the commercial shark fishery, um, and they've been uh, both targeted and incidentally caught in recreational fisheries for a long time. These photos on the left are uh, from a display at Jeanette's Pier in Nags Head. Um, featuring a, uh, a relatively large um, dusky shark, a relatively small hammerhead, and a boring red drum. Um, and then on the right, um, this is just showing uh, some recreational beach-based shark fishing, which is becoming an increasingly popular pastime in North Carolina. And it's mostly a, a catch and release fishery where people um, catch these sharks right off the beach um, and sometimes tag them and uh, release them. Um, and then sometimes, even, even if you're not targeting sharks, um, you'll end up seeing evidence that they're around while you're out fishing. Pretty sure this drum used to be about as long as this guy is tall. Um, and this can actually be a, a big deal. This sort of interaction started making headlines off the Outer Banks this past winter um, with uh, relation to the tuna fishery. But uh, things don't always work out well for sharks when they interact with fisheries. Um, and considerably less uh, regulated fisher, shark fisheries than there are now um, in the 1980s and 1990s caused severe declines in shark populations in the waters of the east coast of the U.S. Um, among the hardest hit species were the sandbar shark and the dusky shark. Um, it's thought that the dusky shark in particular lost uh, 
the equivalent of 65 to 90 percent of its population um, during that period of fishing between the uh, the 80s and 90s. Um, both of these species are now much more heavily regulated. The sandbar shark can only be targeted by a very limited access fishery, and the dusky shark um, you can't keep it all if you catch it, so it's a prohibited species that needs to be released if caught. Um, but these are very long-lived and slow-growing animals. The, uh, the sandbar shark takes about 15 years to get old enough to basically replace itself through reproduction, and for the dusky shark, that could be between 17 to 29 years. Um, so once depleted, it takes a long time for these sharks to recover their populations. And the International Union for Conservation of Nature assesses sandbar sharks as vulnerable worldwide um, and dusky sharks as endangered uh, worldwide and um, in the Northwest Atlantic, which is the part of the Atlantic we sit in, um, in particular. However, it's not all doom and gloom when we talk about sharks and fisheries. Uh, since the 1990s, um, the National Marine Fisheries Service in the U.S. has gotten considerably better at managing uh, shark populations and for many species, um, their numbers are actually trending upwards or at least starting to recover to the levels they were at before. Um, the sandbar shark is, uh, is showing increases and in fact is actually a relatively common species in North Carolina waters now. Um, the black tip sharks are increasing and stabilizing. Um, tiger sharks are doing particularly well. They seem to be uh, rocketing up. And spinner sharks, which are uh, closely related to black tip sharks, um, are also showing an increasing trend. So all of this uh, brings into relief the importance of figuring out where shark habitat is. Um, sharks are uh, really highly migratory species. They can range across entire coastlines um, and they can even cross entire ocean basins over the course of their annual migrations. Um, so they tend to not spend uh, too long in any one particular place. Um, however, the uh, we can use the Matt Hooper model, Hooper being the marine biologist in Jaws, who said that all sharks do is swim and eat and make little sharks. Um, and this is actually not a bad model for uh, defining good shark habitat. Um, sharks need uh, steady and reliable migratory corridors to migrate through, so they gotta swim. They gotta eat, so these areas where sharks tend to pause in their annual migrations tend to be areas with reliable sources of food, um, and they've gotta make little sharks. So nursery habitats are particularly important as shark habitat, and they tend to be um, much more enclosed and closer to shore than most of the habitat for the adults. Uh, these are areas where the young are born and they might spend the first few years to decade of their lives before they start uh, acting like adults and having these big long migrations. Um, in the US, the National Marine Fishery Service would classify this type of habitat as essential fish habitat or habitat required to complete an animal's life cycle. And this is um, actually uh, defining this habitat and figuring out where it is is an important part of uh, some of the management and conservation measures for these shark species. So the main way that I've been trying to find shark habitat is using a method called acoustic telemetry. Um, and this is, uh, this is a type of shark tagging. Um, we take a, an electronic acoustic transmitter and we surgically implant it into the shark's body. We use a local anesthetic when we do this. Um, when we capture the shark, we also roll it on its back, which puts it in a non-responsive state called tonic immobility. Uh, between these two methods, um, the surgery is relatively harmless for the shark. Uh, once the tag is inside, um, it's transmitting an ultrasonic frequency that carries a unique ID code for each individual shark. Um, as the shark's swimming around, it'll swim into detection range of acoustic receivers, which are represented by all the dots on this map. Those are receivers that have, uh, or the locations of receivers that have picked up at least one of our tagged animals. Um, and when the shark swims within detection range, the receiver will log the date and the time and sometimes some other associated data um, with that tag transmission. And then we'll go out and download it and connect the dots um, to basically see where that shark has been. Uh, we don't own all of the receivers that are out there. No one entity could possibly cover the entire East Coast of the US. Um, so we're part of uh, a couple different um, collaborative acoustic telemetry networks, including the ACT and FACT networks. And these basically allow researchers that are members of these networks and using this type of technology to be able to tell other researchers that they pick up their tags if they get them. Um, through membership in these networks, we actually can potentially um, pick up a tagged shark if it migrates anywhere between uh, the Florida Keys and parts of the Caribbean all the way up to Nova Scotia in Canada. Um, and our actual range uh, shown here in this map 
um, is actually from the most extreme northern one there is off of Martha's Vineyard off Massachusetts. Most of our sharks um, tend to migrate between New York and Florida. Um, so uh, again, all these dots are areas where receivers picked up our sharks. The lines are what we've managed to piece together um, from their, uh, their tag detections and the timing that we picked them up. And North Carolina in particular is an interesting spot for many of our tag species. If you look really closely and pay attention to what color those dots are and the lines are, um, some of our Northern species, uh, North Carolina is about as far South as they go. And for some of our Southern species that we've originally tagged off Florida, um, North Carolina is about as far North as they'll migrate. So North Carolina seems to be this transition zone um, where both of our major uh, communities of sharks um, kind of intersect and overlap. Um, the reason for that is that North Carolina is a very interesting place um, oceanography wise. This is a, a map of sea surface temperature. The darker red the water is, the, uh, the higher the sea surface temperature. And that really dark red going up the East Coast is the Gulf Stream coming up out of the Gulf of Mexico and bringing really warm, salty water. Um, it hugs pretty close to the shore until it hits Cape Hatteras. And then Cape Hatteras kind of deflects it off into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, what this means for the sharks, and this is kind of the starting point, say, in the, the mid to late summer, um, represented by the bull shark off North Carolina there is the summer community of sharks. And then there's a dusky shark up off Massachusetts representing the, uh, the winter community of sharks. Um, and then as the, uh, the water cools down in the fall, you'll see those summer sharks move down. Many of them end up in the Caribbean or Florida. And then the winter sharks also uh, shift southward. And many of those winter sharks that were summering off of New England and New York um, are spending their winters off the Outer Banks. And the reverse will happen in the spring. Um, you'll see these sharks switch places. The, uh, the winter sharks will leave and the summer sharks will come back in. So there's a, uh, a distinct set of species that really kind of define these summer and winter shark um, communities, as well as a group of sharks that are uh, frankly here about year round. Um, the summer shark, among the summer sharks, the bull shark and the tiger shark tend to be the, uh, the apex predators. Um, they both reach maximum sizes over 10 feet. Uh, the bull shark can hit about 11 feet and then it just keeps getting wider. Um, and then the tiger shark can uh, reach up to 20 feet. Um, black tip sharks are a little bit more in the middleweight category. They max out at about eight feet long. Most of the black tips you'll see in North Carolina will be six feet or less. Um, and then the Atlantic sharp nose shark um, is definitely our most common species among the, uh, the summer shark community. If you've ever been um, fishing down on the coast and keep catching these little foot long uh, tiny gray sharks while you're trying to catch literally anything else. Um, those are baby uh, Atlantic shark nose sharks. They were probably born earlier in the summer. Um, and the adults are about the size of the one you see here. They max out at about four feet long. Um, not very big, but pretty fearless and uh, really common. And then among our winter sharks, um, we have some celebrity appearances. Anybody who follows the, uh, the OSERT shark tracker um, knows that there are white sharks that come down off of North Carolina during the winter. Some of them linger off the Outer Banks and some of them go continue down to Florida, um, but white sharks are definitely part of our uh, winter shark community. Thresher sharks are also right in there as well. And you can actually find um, young thresher sharks about the size of the one you see pictured here, um, almost up to the beach during the winter um, along the Outer Banks. Um, the spiny dogfish um, are kind of the sharp nosed shark of the winter. Um, they are terrible at social distancing. They travel around in these schools of uh, hundreds to thousands of individuals. Um, and if you catch one, uh, you are almost definitely going to catch nothing but dogfish until you move. Um, but they're, uh, they're definitely my favorite species of shark. Uh, my opinion, the best shark. Um, just really, really fascinating animals. They actually evolve from deep sea sharks and move around in the shallows now. Um, sandbar sharks are very common in the off the Outer Banks during the winter, especially juveniles, which in some cases can actually rival the spiny dogfish in sheer numbers. Um, these juvenile sandbar sharks form groups off the Outer Banks, and they're primarily individuals that were born in the Chesapeake Bay and migrated down for the winter. And then the dusky shark is a definite winter migrant um, to North Carolina, and one of the reasons why uh, um, there's a lot of attention paid to the, uh, the shark communities in North Carolina because, again, this is a particularly hard hit um, species by overfishing. And then there are groups of sharks that seem to have different segments of the population that are off North Carolina at different times of year. Um, the spinner shark is classically thought to be kind of a summer species, but 
interestingly, every spinner shark that we've tagged um, off of uh, Ocean City, Maryland, um, during the uh, the late fall and uh, or during the late summer and early fall, has come down to North Carolina to overwinter. Um, so there's at least some segment of the spinner shark population that seems to act a bit more like a winter shark, but you can find these off North Carolina during the summer as well. Um, the uh, there are four hammerhead species that call North Carolina home. Uh, during the summer, you can find the largest and the smallest. The largest being the great hammerhead, and the smallest being the bonnet head, which comes in in uh, some pretty good numbers in some of the inshore areas. And then during the winter, uh, particularly off the Outer Banks, you can find both scalloped and smooth hammerheads. Um, sandbar sharks that are of uh, larger sizes can be found year round off North Carolina and can be spotted uh, patrolling the, uh, the wrecks in between all those sand tiger sharks. Um, and I'll just move clockwise and talk about them next. Uh, the sand tigers are another one of our more famous species here. Very popular with divers because they're actually quite mellow uh, despite looking really fierce. Um, and they're another very social shark species. Um, some of them migrate down from the, uh, the Delaware Bay area um, during the winter. Others seem to stick around North Carolina all year round and you can, uh, you can find them on the wrecks diving. Um, and then finally we have the smooth dogfish which is not even that closely related to the spiny dogfish, um, but it's another relatively small species. The biggest ones are about five feet long. Um, the adults kind of migrate in and out of North Carolina during the winter, but they give birth in the North Carolina Sound. So they're juveniles that will spend their uh, at least first couple summers um, hanging out in seagrass beds in particular um, in Pamlico Sound, uh, Back Sound and Bogue Sound. So I want to um, zero in on the dusky shark a bit because it's one that uh, I've been that's been a real focus of my tagging work up at uh, up at the Smithsonian. Um, the majority of our uh, our dusky sharks have been tagged off Maryland, with another handful tagged off of the uh, the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and they've uh, we've picked them up between uh, about Long Island, New York, down into North Carolina. This is a bit of an older map. We have a couple detections off of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, as well, but that's about as far south as we've gotten them. Um, during the winter, they really cluster up in this area that's highlighted in purple here, and that's an area called the Mid-Atlantic Shark Closed Area. So in addition to being a prohibited species, the dusky shark is uh, protected by this area that's put in place by the National Marine Fishery Service that closes um, an area of water about the equivalent of most of the continental shelf off North Carolina um, to the types of gear that are most commonly used in commercial shark fisheries. And this is because um, a lot of juvenile dusky sharks and sandbar sharks migrate into this area during the winter, um, and this measure allows those uh, vulnerable juveniles to avoid being incidentally caught in fisheries. Um, when we look at the, uh, the latitude that we picked up these dusky sharks, um, the latitudes on the, uh, the X or the Y axis there, um, and this is basically a measure of how far north they've gone. So highlighted in red are the areas off Delaware and Maryland that we originally tagged them in. Um, and then they travel down to uh, areas off Virginia, eventually reach North Carolina waters highlighted in blue. Um, and after three years worth of data, we have a pretty good idea of this um, kind of oscillating north-south pattern where they migrate between North Carolina in the winter up to uh, waters off of, off of uh, New York um, during the, uh, the summer. Although some of them will linger off of Maryland for quite a while as well. Um, if you uh, tuned in to Dr. Smith's um, presentation earlier, we used that same kind of satellite data that she was showing for Earth, showing that shows sea surface temperature, chlorophyll, all of those things. Um, we actually overlay that over our tag detections and use that to get an idea of what the environment is like, both where we picked up the sharks and where we didn't. Um, so that way we can compare where the sharks are with where they're not to get an idea of what they're looking for in terms of habitat. So a couple of things have been pretty consistent. This is comparing fall 2017 with the following summer in 2018. And during both seasons, um, we tend to get uh, the higher up the, these lines are, the more of a positive association they have with your likelihood of running into a dusky shark. Um, so between about 16 and, and 26 degrees Celsius, uh, that's when you're likely to, uh, to find dusky sharks. That's their preferred temperature range. And then chlorophyll also tends to be a, uh, an important environmental factor um, for determining where dusky shark habitat is. It's almost as influential as temperature in some cases. And you might be thinking chlorophyll is usually a measure of how much phytoplankton there is in the water. These big dusky sharks, these things max out at 14 feet, they eat smaller sharks. There's no way these things are out there just scooping up plankton. 
Um, but in areas of high uh, chlorophyll, this tends to be areas where there are a lot of plankton. That plankton brings in schools of fish. This is a school of menhaden that I photographed moving around at the, uh, the surface. Um, and then these schools of fish in turn bring in sharks that come in to, uh, to eat them. Um, and this happens in pretty rapid succession. You get an algae bloom, you get fish eating the algae, you get sharks eating the fish um, to the point where uh, chlorophyll itself ends up being a pretty good indicator of where these uh, higher level predator habitats are. Um, so where the phytoplankton is, there's probably a good source of other food that the sharks are actually there to eat. Um, and when we map where these good conditions are, we get an idea that in the, we get a pretty good idea where good dusky shark habitat might be. Um, so you can think of this as being a map of kind of your shark forecast. The darker blue the color is, your, the kind of higher your chances of um, running into a dusky shark in that area um, based on the environmental conditions. And um, the, uh, the really good dusky shark habitat in the fall seems to go from Maryland down to about Cape Canaveral, Florida. Um, and then during the summer, we get a, uh, a nice little cluster of dusky shark habitat off the Delaware Bay, um, up off of New Jersey and New York. And there's even some areas that get highlighted uh, north of Cape Cod in northern New England, um, which is interesting. So moving back to how we define shark habitat, sharks got to swim, sharks got to eat, sharks got to make little sharks. Um, and these areas where they're doing these activities tend to be strongly influenced by what the temperature range is and the food availability. Um, sure, there are other environmental factors that might, be, might help define habitat, but for the most part, sharks wanna go somewhere that's a comfortable temperature where they can find a lot of food. Um, now, what you'll notice is this is not, um, this doesn't mean that they're going necessarily to the same exact spot every year. Um, they're not usually keying in on one particular reef or one particular bay unless they're really attached to a particular nursery habitat, um, which means that with changing ocean conditions, um, the areas these sharks are keying in on can actually change too. And North Carolina being in that environmental break with Cape Hatteras might be one of the first places this is happening. Um, these are, uh, this pictured here on the right is a juvenile bull shark. Um, large bull sharks have been encountered in North Carolina for as long as people have been keeping records. Um, but juveniles were fairly rare. Uh, this graph shows catches in the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries gillnet survey in, um, in Pamlico Sound, our largest estuary here in North Carolina. Um, and before 2011, um, juvenile bull sharks were pretty rare sporadic catches. Um, and then around 2012, you see this big spike in these catches of these baby sharks. Um, and then the following year, it drops back down, but they're not all the way gone. And it's been kind of increasing and plateauing off every year since. Um, and this graph ends at 2016, but I've actually continued to come down to North Carolina to take samples from juvenile bull sharks every year since then. So at least all the way through last summer, there are parts of Pamlico Sound now where you can reliably catch juvenile bull sharks. Um, and the reason for this is um, this, uh, this is showing uh, data, temperature data from uh, the DMF um, trawl survey, which goes back a lot further than the gillnet survey, all the way to 1970s. Um, the blue dots and the blue line show the temperature trend during May and June. So these are early summer temperatures in Pamlico Sound. And starting around the mid 2000s, about 2005, 2008, we see a real warming trend um, in Pamlico Sound during those, uh, those early summer months or those early summer weeks. Um, and since about 2009 to 2010, uh, the average temperature in Pamlico Sound in the early summer has not dropped below about 25 degrees Celsius. Um, this is comfortable swimming water for humans. Um, and this is also similar conditions to what you see in already known bull shark nursery habitats in Florida. Um, and sure enough, this, uh, this dark red line are those catches from the, uh, the gillnet survey. Um, and you're seeing that big spike in bull shark catches right around the same time that those average temperatures are going up. Um, so the increase in water temperature has actually made um, Pamlico Sound potentially a nursery habitat for bull sharks. Um, so there have, there have been bull sharks in North Carolina for a while, but climate change might be changing how they're using North Carolina waters. Um, loads and loads of people to thank. Funding sources have to give a particular shout out to North Carolina Sea Grant um, and all the uh, volunteers, interns, um, other folks who have uh, who've come out and helped me try to catch and tag all these sharks. Um, and with that, uh, you can find me on Twitter as at SpineyDag. And if I've left enough time, I'll happily take some questions. 
much. Thanks, Chuck. Awesome stuff. Sharks, climate change, habitat. Man, you, you know, when I think about Earth Day, um, I tend to think about the incredible diversity of life on Earth. And I think about little bitty critters and big critters and birds and mammals and reptiles and amphibians. But when you just grab one of those little groups of animals, or not so little, but just grab one and then explore the diversity just within that, it's incredible. So uh, there are some questions that have come in, just a few here. Did you just monitor between New York and North Carolina, or did you see if these sharks went further north and south? That is a great question. Um... So the uh, receivers within the networks that we're a part of go all the way up to Nova Scotia, Canada, um, and all the way down uh, to the Florida Keys. Um, so if our sharks did go that far, uh, there's a good chance that we would have picked them up. Um, so that actually gives us some confidence that we've uh, managed to kind of capture the extreme northern and southern extents of those migratory ranges. Um, but yeah, the uh, our collaborators in those networks um, could absolutely have the potential to tell us um, if our sharks were to go, say, all the way up to Canada. And Susan has posted a question on behalf of eight-year-old Spence. How big do you think the chopped-in-half drum was? <laughs> um, I'm not 100% sure how tall the guy holding it was, um, but uh, I would say that drum um, was probably at least a good four and a half, five feet long, which is enormous for a red drum. Um, I remember when I was, uh, that, that picture actually comes from one of the, uh, the Division Marine Fisheries surveys. And I remember when I was sent that, that was, uh, that kind of blew my mind um, that somebody could come along and chop a fish that, uh, that big in half like that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, let's see, and Mason wants to know, oh, what your favorite shark is and why? I think you can go to this, that one, but tell us again. Hashtag best shark is. Oh, the spiny dogfish for sure. Um, good old squalas of Canthias. Um, they're a, uh, they're kind of, they're an interesting species. I've got a whole Twitter thread that's pinned on my profile about this. If you want to read through it all, but um, they tend to be, they're a small shark. They're really hardy in captivity. So they tend to be, they were tended to be one of the first species that a lot of the basic biological work on sharks was done on. Um, so a lot of what we know about sharks in general was initially found out on spiny dogfish. Um, despite that, they're really weird compared to a lot of other sharks. Um, for one thing, they're really, really social. Um, they tend to, uh, you put them in a tank and they'll tend to form a group pretty quickly. Um, and they can also uh, um, actually kind of gang up on prey that's larger than themselves. So I've actually, uh, I got my master's degree looking at their diets and we would find, uh, we would pump their stomachs and find uh, chunks of fish that were larger than the shark that ate them um coming out of their stomachs wow um so they they actually they're small um but they've got pretty sharp teeth and they can uh they can grab onto things and really bite down on it um but yeah they're just really really cool species so much about them is really interesting the fact that all their other closest relatives are deep sea species um is pretty cool yeah i uh you know the other best shark that i had seen on twitter was sandbar sharks they're fine uh, but I don't know, spiny dogfish, that's a pretty cool shark. Yeah. Didn't even mention the fin spines. They can stick you with their dorsal fins. Oh my gosh. They just get better and better. So Chuck, thank you so much for being here for Earth Day. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, thanks for having me. And hey, everybody, there's, if you can believe it, there's more science coming your way. Chuck, thank you so much. Happy Earth Day. Hope to see you around North Carolina again real soon. Hope to be back soon. Take care. Everybody, thanks for sticking with us. I hope that you're enjoying the show. Uh, the fun doesn't stop yet. Uh, Earth Day is still going, so we're still going with the Earth Day Streamathon here at the Museum of Natural Sciences. Uh, you know, I've got my popcorn and I've got some fizzy water and I have my reusable stainless steel straw, so I am set to just keep rocking and rolling with the science. And in fact, we're going to, yeah, it looks like we're ready to welcome our very next guest from the NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia, project scientist for NASA Globe Clouds, 
Marile, welcome. Hi, it's so I'm so happy to be here with you all today. Happy Earth Day! It's 50 years of Earth Day. We can't believe about that. Right? I this is such a great celebration that we're having. Uh, we've learned so much in the last. Gosh, we've been going for for more than two hours now with the Streamathon, and we've learned a ton about planet Earth, planet Earth's neighbors in the solar system. But the the science keeps going. Uh, how are you? How are you doing today? How are things? It's been great. We did a scavenger hunt in our yard to look for things to make sure that our yard is healthy. Beautiful days outside. I love clouds. I love sharks. Actually, this was great. Sharks are one of my favorite animals. So, I'm I'm excited. This has been a great day. There you go. A little bit of something for everybody. So, uh, your project scientist with NASA Globe Clouds. Oh, uh, what's your job like working with NASA? Oh, it's fantastic. It's the best place to work. Um, you get to do what you love. And so everybody has their passion in it. Um, and you find people from everywhere, from all around the world, and happy to help you out. There's no wrong question to ask. So if I need help with something, I can go uh, to one of my coworkers and they'll be super happy to help me out or go to other NASA centers. There's 10 different NASA centers. Um, so it's a really exciting place to work at. And you meet some cool people, right? So, and you get, at NASA Langley, we have 22 different wind tunnels. So sometimes I get to walk inside of a wind tunnel. I can't complain, it's awesome. <laughs> oh, wow. Now I read uh, that you're an atmospheric scientist. So it kind of, it makes sense in my mind that you're uh, helping out with this globe clouds project, which I think we're gonna learn a little bit about right now. So uh, I'll go ahead and turn the show over to you. Everybody, please welcome Marle Colon Robles. Thank you so much. So yes, the GLOBE program. So the GLOBE program actually today just celebrated 25 years. It started when teachers and researchers got together and came up with ways on how students can collect data. Um, in 2016, we released the GLOBE Observer app which here's a picture of, and it just started with clouds. And now you can see you can make mosquito ha habitat maps, land cover um, measurements, and tree height pictures. And all you need is a mobile device. The app is free. It works on Android and Apple devices. And we welcome all sorts of types of observations because we actually use the data. Researchers are actually using the data. And so just about clouds, Cloud is the most popular uh, protocol, the most popular observation, probably because clouds change a lot. And that's, probably, that's one of the reasons why they're so difficult to study in the climate perspective, to see how it's affecting the climate. Um, but you guys, all you citizen scientists, are doing an awesome job. This is just all the cloud observations collected since 2017. So the GLOBE program, there's over 120 countries participating. And if you notice, I, there's observations even in Antarctica. There's people that get on boats that go to Antarctica and while they're on boats, they make observations. There's people overwintering right now in Svalbard in the Arctic Circle making cloud observations. We get a lot of, um, awesome observations from people and you can join as well. It's completely free. It does require an email to register, but anybody can use it. And a NASA Langley Research Center, which is the very first of all the NASA centers, this is where um, Catherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn and Mary Jackson worked. We do a lot of satellite data as well with all the computing uh, capabilities. And we match your observations to satellite data. Yes, we send you a NASA personalized email that compares your observations with satellite data. And at the bottom, you can click on the picture of the satellite centered in your location. So we've done matches, over 230,000 matches. We match to geostationary data. We match to aqua, Terra, and the awesome Calypso. Calypso is a laser in space that shoots down at us. Yes, lasers in space. Um, it's really easy to use the app. Here are just some screenshots from the app. 
it's basic questions. Do you see clouds? Is the sky clear? Or is it obscured? Obscured is a weird word, but obscured means, is there something covering the sky or the clouds? And that can be dust, haze, smoke. And then there's a lot of photographs to help you out. So you don't have to be an expert. And I'm gonna stop sharing here just for a second. We need your observations. You don't have to feel like you're an expert. You're just doing your best guess because what we need is the number of observations. The more observations that we have, the better the statistics that we can do when we're doing research with the data. So just follow the prompts and the pictures. You'll do perfect, okay? So I promise you, don't feel like you have to be an expert. And then just last week, at the end of last week, in the beginning of this week, we released a cloud wizard, which asks you some questions to help you out and really guess which cloud type you're looking at. And then there's some gamification going on because the app takes pictures for you automatically. All you have to do is put the letter inside of the black circle and poof, the picture takes. Um, so what it's asking you is pictures in every cardinal direction. So if you see here the picture of the S, that's for south. So north, south, east, west, upward, and then down to see the um, land cover. So here are some pictures of people, actually students that took. You see contrails, you see cirrus clouds, you see a little bit of halos. Cirrus are one of the most difficult cloud types for certain types of satellites because they can be so thin. We call them um, sub-visible cirrus, but for our, uh, for our eyes, you can see them. So this is where some of your observations have a huge impact when we compare them to satellite data. So again, you receive an email and with a table, and this is one of the tables, an example table. It has your observations and the satellites so you can see how well the satellite did compared to you, what you guys saw together and what you didn't. So your perspective is actually really, really important. So if this is a cloud, the satellite sees the top of the cloud. We see the bottom of the cloud and then together we have a complete story. And especially if there's clouds on top or clouds beneath, you might still see. This is where, again, those Two points of view are so, so important. So again, just make your observations. Don't worry if you don't think it's perfect, it'll be okay. And then we have our website, globe.gov-web.school, and that's where you can find a lot of more information. People have gotten really creative in sending other types of observations. And here's an awesome picture a few weeks ago of a dust storm. So we are also asking people to uh, report dust storms. If you go into an obscuration, I know that's a weird word, but an obscuration, uh, this is actually helping uh, researchers in the World Meteorological Organization because as the climate is changing, as those cloud types that precipitate or rain move to other areas, you'll see drier places or you'll see areas dry up and they become new sources of dust. So they really need help figuring out the land cover type, seeing if land is now becoming drier, and then detecting dust storms like these. You don't have to live near a desert to see dust storms, okay? So if you see any type of event like this, you, you see here the options. You can also report uh, fires, volcanic ash, anything like that. Will accepted. It's awesome observations. Um, one of another example. This is a haboob. Haboob is a dust storm in Australia, and and this person took the pictures, and it was actually completely cloud covered. So in satellite data, we did not even see the storm. So again, another way that your observations as a citizen scientist are making a huge impact. Now we just put out a family guide. Um, I hope you guys, um, if you want to do some cloud observations or some activities, you can go there. There's a video of me with my girls. If you want to see us do a cloud dance, yes, there's such a thing. You can do a cloud dance with, with, with us uh, or do some cloud cover estimation and just see us NASA researchers as regular people as well. 
Um, so you can go and visit that and learn a little bit more about cloud types. So I hope that you all make some awesome observations about clouds and the observations are being used. They're being used in weather models and climate models, You're particularly total cloud cover. Um, they're being used for contrail investigations, especially there's a lot of people at NASA Langley interested in the types of engines that the airplanes um, use and which ones are more efficient and which ones are not. Um, and then total cloud cover and looking at um, cloud types. So just do your observations. We are using it all the time. We might have a challenge in 2018. We did a fall cloud challenge. And the winners of the challenge get a shout out from a NASA scientist. So it's a really cool deal. Just if there's any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. <laughs> this is really cool and interesting stuff. Uh, I, I would have never thought that NASA was interested in the, the ground-based viewpoint of clouds, not when they've got dozens of satellites looking down on Earth. That's right. But again, if there's many different types of clouds, and when you go outside, you'll notice that sometimes there's different types of clouds altogether. Satellites might not see all of them. Or maybe there was a time where the satellite had a hard time with the data, right? If there's a big solar storm or something, we have to turn off the satellites. Your observations do a huge impact. And it's that comparison, right? Researchers are trying to make those uh, detections uh, stronger and more efficient. So your observations from the ground up are huge. And they're um, really helpful because we can move easily versus a station, like a weather station. Doesn't a lot of you guys moved to the path of the tally and made observations of clouds during the solar eclipse. And we actually did a huge research with it. So it, there's huge benefits. So thank you to everybody that's already made observations and welcome to anybody that wants to start making new observations. So how do people find the Observer app and get involved? So just search on your um, app stores or anything, Globe Observer, NASA Globe Observer. Or you can go to our website, observer.globe.gov. Sounds great. I hope everybody jumps in and gets involved. <laughs> this is a great way to do it, right? Just take pictures of clouds. You're looking up at the clouds anyway, right? Why not That's just right. go ahead and take a picture? That's right. Well, Marilee, thanks so much for being here and helping us celebrate Earth Day's 50th anniversary. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Take care. So everybody, we're, we're getting close to the end, uh, but our shark scientist guest that we had, Chuck Bangley, and Marilee, our NASA Langley Research Project scientist who we just heard from, uh, they both came to us through North Carolina Sea Grant and North Carolina Space Grant in, in one way or another, connecting us to people near and far. And I actually had a chance before the show started to chat with the executive director, Susan White, of North Carolina Sea Grant, Space Grant, and the Water Resources Research Institute, all of which are based out of North Carolina State University. So take a look at what Susan had to say about celebrating Earth Day. Hi, Susan, welcome. Hello, Chris. It's great to be here. Thanks for taking part in our Earth Day celebration and for taking some time to chat with me. Absolutely. You know, we're cozy here at, a, at our homes and hoping you're doing the same. Well, Susan, tell me a little bit about your work. What is your role with North Carolina Sea Grant, Space Grant, and the Water Resources Research Institute? I, I would be happy to. It's quite a mouthful. So I am the executive director of three state-based programs here in North Carolina. We're administered at NC State University, but we really do serve the entire state, from the mountains to the coast. Um, these three programs uh, include the North Carolina Sea Grant Program, which is a NOAA, which is a National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration Program. 
within the um, U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, we also direct the um, Water Resources Research Institute, with it, which is a USGS geological survey within the Department of Interior program. And then finally, the uh, North Carolina Space Grant Program, which is a NASA program. Um, and it is, they are all interconnected in many different ways. So it's, it's a real joy to be uh, on such great teams together here in North Carolina. What would be some examples of the kinds of opportunities that these different programs provide? So we all, all three programs provide grant funding opportunities for faculty and students across the state. Um, that's one of the major priorities of the program is to make sure that we are linking uh, the research resources that we have uh, with the questions that our communities have in, across the state. And so that could be um, focused on, uh, you know, beach renourishment, hurricane recovery, all the way up to uh, water quality and sedimentation in, uh, in the various streams and rivers across the nation, across the state. So, you know, that's one of the major premises, but we also have uh, a lot of great um, in-house expertise that provides counseling uh, in, this, in the sense of uh, relationship building between the community members and our academic institutions across the state who are, as you know, quite fabulous. What are some of the benefits that, say, a North Carolinian would see from having these programs here in the state? One of the pieces that we strive to, to have impacts in the state with our community members is really understanding how individuals um, can be successful in their lives, both economically um, as well as in their health, but also how we work together um, as North Carolinians to, to bring resources to our state that help us um, conserve and uh, create sustainable environments uh, for, and, and I'll speak specifically for Sea Grant here, um, for our coasts. And so it's anything, um, the impacts could be seen in you know, more uh, uh, saltwater fish that reaches our tables through restaurants and wholesale. Uh, it could be more oysters uh, uh, coming in from our oyster sites over time. Um, but it could also be uh, the way that we think about uh, beach water quality and how recreation really drives an economy uh, across our state. So there's a lot of different ways that, that we can see um, individual North, Carolinian, uh, North Carolinians uh, being invested in our programs and benefiting from them. Tell me a little bit about how these three organizations work together. Yeah. You know, I think one of the really unique pieces of our programs are um, the investment that our team has in students, um, specifically through a series of research fellowships. Um, we value uh, developing the next generation workforce in a, in a number of different ways. And that's how one of the reasons why our programs work so well together. We often host joint fellowship opportunities. Um, for example, we had uh, and, and continue to have a sea and space grant fellowship opportunity and it gets really confusing because their acronyms are the same so you gotta watch out for that um, <laughs> where we get um, students interested in using NASA technologies or NASA databases satellite bases um, international observations uh, with NOAA resource and uh, needs here in North Carolina so it could be looking at changing ghost forests, uh, which is in looking at the changes of salinity, um, increasing over time, uh, and how they impact forests on our coasts. It could be at harmful algal blooms, uh, distribution and rise and fall over a season of these uh, algal blooms in our water, our waterways. That's one of, the, one of the ways that we see a lot of overlap amongst our programs, is looking really at how we bridge um, data resources and technology to address the sort of grand challenges that we're seeing in our state, water quality, um, uh, public health questions, post-hurricanes, a lot of those are overlapping amongst our program. If people want to learn more about these organizations and what they're doing, how do they find out? Yeah, no, there is an enormous amount of information on our websites as well as on our Facebook and Twitter feeds. So our website for Sea Grant is ncseagrant.org. For Space Grant is ncspacegrant.org. And for the Water Resources Research Institute, it is wrri.ncsu.edu. And our Twitter handles, if you're interested in seeing sort of the more recent opportunities um, and linking back to our websites, Sea uh, Grant is at Sea Grant NC. Water Institute is at NC underscore WRRI. And Space Grant is at NC Space Grant. 
So those are all great opportunities, and we hope to see you uh, visiting us and learning more about our programs. Susan, thank you for being part of our Earth Day 50th celebration with the museum. It is always a pleasure, Chris. We look forward to uh, all of the museum's productions over this course of this time, and looking forward to getting back in your halls. Me too. Me too. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. And thanks again to Susan, uh, to Sea Grant, Space Grant, Water Resources Research Institute. Uh, also thanks to the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education and so many other partners uh, and organizations and institutions that work with us at the Museum of Natural Sciences to learn more, educate, research, and share the word about science and nature. Uh, all right, everybody. If you've just joined us, my name is Chris. I'm curator for the Daily Planet Theater at the museum, which is the giant globe right here outside of our museum in downtown Raleigh. I am your conductor for this Earth Day 50th anniversary train with the museum. And everybody, this train is pulling in to the station. I'm going to bring up the final guests of our Earth Day Streamathon to celebrate maybe some of the hidden biodiversity uh, that you don't think about so much. Our next guests are going to be the collections manager for non-molluscan invertebrates, Megan McCuller, and the research curator of same said collection, non-molluscan invertebrates, Dr. Bronwyn Williams. As soon as we can get them into the show here, I see them. There they are. Hi, Bronwyn. How are you? Megan, are you there? I am here. <laughs> Fantastic. Welcome to the 50th anniversary of Earth Day with the museum. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Megan, I love it. It's like you're there in the collection. I know. <laughs> That's perfect. That's perfect. Uh, Dr. Williams, it looks like you're there doing what we're all doing, I guess, for real, right? We're all sitting at home right now. It's past my bedtime, so, you know, it's be comfy. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad that you chose to uh, stay up for us for Earth Day. <laughs> always, always. Well, let's see. Uh, I think, Megan, did you want to go ahead and get us started? Yeah. So I just have like three slides to share with you. I'm going to make it short and sweet, hopefully. I'll do that now if I can remember how to do it. There we go. There we go. Okay, so um, I study these little animals called bryozoans or moss animals. And they're these little marine organisms that are colonial. So they um, live all together, sort of like corals, but they're much smaller than that. Um, they're marine and they can be found in pretty much all ocean habitats with the exception of like in the open ocean. Um, but there are some that are free living that can sort of like walk around. Uh, I use the word walk slightly, but I've got a video up here that's, well, it's a gif, but uh, that has a bunch of bryozoan um, tentacles out and feeding. So you can see that each one is uh, its own little individual. It's got its little, uh, gut chamber and it lives in sort of this little box. So they're really just the U-shaped bag of guts and a ring of tentacles with a mouth in the center. They filter feed little particles out of the water. And then a little video, if I can figure out how to share this. There we go. Same thing, just a different species. I enjoy this one because its tentacles are long and luscious and curly. Let's go back again. Somebody hit the table while this 
colony was out, and so all the tentacles retracted, so they can go back into their little box home if they get scared. And one of the things I wanted to talk about, or rather the major thing I wanted to talk about was uh, bryozoan diversity. And this slide just shows all the different kinds of bryozoans that there are. They encrust rocks, um, can live on mussel shells, and um, lots of other things. Uh, hermit crabs, there's some hermit crab shells that have that are covered in bryozoans. Those are called Texas longhorns. You can actually sometimes find those washed up on the beach. Uh, they're species that are really flexible, um, so they can grow on kelp. And then there's some that look like these big ribbon shapes. Uh, they grow back to back. And then other ones are little trees. They look like little trees. Those are called arborescent bryozoans. There's some that look like a uh, mesh. Some of them are boring, but not boring. They, so they uh, bore through the shell and they live inside the shell material. And then others look like little domes and some even look like spaghetti. So there's lots and lots of these growth forms of bryzoans. And that's one reason why there's not a lot of people who study this phylum because it's sort of overwhelming. They can be difficult to identify as well. You have to use a scanning electron microscopy in order to do that pretty accurately. So one thing is, let's see, I'm going to stop sharing now. Let me go back. There we go. So I actually have one example at home. You can sort of see uh, my fake <laughs> uh, collection in the background, but this is actually what it looks like. It's our collection. Um, so we have all this fluid preserved stuff at the research lab. And um, these lots have usually a bunch of different specimens in them. We've got sponges and, um, and uh, corals, and we've got tons of crabs of all sorts. And Bronwyn in a few minutes will tell you about crayfish and all the cool things on those. But, one thing I'm interested in is um, all the stuff that you can find in those lots of random things um, that actually have. So you might have a sponge, a lot of sponges that actually has a ton of bryozoans in it and a bunch of other stuff like barnacles, um, tube worms, things like that. So I have an example to have it in front of my face so it actually shows up, but. These are all the bryzones I've collected from uh, a lot of sponges. And um, I've done some analyses and I've looked at quite a lot of our um, stuff and identified bryzones from them. Probably about 300 lots or so, so far, mostly of uh, sponges and corals and um, things like that some mollusks as well. But I found over a thousand species of bryzoans um, on those lots, which averages out to about four, four and a half um, additional species per lot. So that means that museum collections like ours and all the other invertebrate zoology uh, collections actually have a lot more specimens than um, you might actually think they do. So there's potentially just tons of little bitty miniature invertebrates hanging out all throughout the collection. And it just yep. takes somebody with the, the right training, the right eye to go through and find them all. Yeah. So how do you, how do you even know when something's got a, a brazoan on it when even just to ID them, you need scanning electron microscopes. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I can tell just because I sort of have that search image of what they look like um, and all the diversity that there is. So sometimes I can just look at a lot and say, yep, there's bryzoans in there. 
<laughs> and I'll look at it, but sometimes I can't. Um, and I might just grab it because it's a cool thing to look at. And there's Bryce Owens in there. Um, sometimes we have crabs or um, flipper lobsters, things like that. So you might be like, well, there's not going to be anything else in there. And then there's a colony that's growing on the underside. So you can find them in some pretty weird places as well. Now, if you find Bryzoans on another specimen, do you somehow remove them from the specimen and separate them out? Or do you just mark it on the jar and keep moving? Um, it really depends. Sometimes I can kind of scrape them off using a fine scalpel or a little pinhead. Other times, um, I just make a note of it and take pictures. We can put it in our database that way as well. How did, how did you become interested in bryozoans? I mean, I can't imagine <laughs> that there are just a ton of bryozoan experts in the world. Uh, you must be one of only a handful. I mean, there's lots of people who love invertebrates out there, sure, but the bryozoans? Uh, sorry, my, my cat just woke up from her nap. Um, <laughs> she's very loud. Uh, yeah, there's really not that many people that specialize in bryozoans. Um, and there's only, I'm one of like maybe two or three. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's being generous, uh, in the, in the United States, at least. Um, Worldwide, there's a few more. Most of them are in Europe or um, um, New Zealand or Australia. Uh, yeah, she's being very loud. Uh, <laughs> um, and I got into it because for my master's research, I, uh, I really apologize. <laughs> for my master's research, I studied sea slugs that uh, fed on bryozoan specifically. And um, I guess it just sort of built from there. So bryozoans really are part of this greater ecosystem, like each one of them in their colony filtering out little bits of food, but then also eaten by sea slugs? Yeah. <laughs> um, sea slugs are one of the, I would say, I guess, major predators of bryozoans. Uh, sea urchins will eat them on accident just because they're growing on kelp or whatever. Um, but I think nudibranchs are really the main specialized predators of them and then um i think i forgot your other question but yeah <laughs> they, the, the nice thing is is that they're um they have a calcium carbonate skeleton so it persists after the animals themselves die so you can actually see them um afterwards uh so, so they're there for a long time and in the fossil record as well Quite a few people study fossil bryozoans, actually. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so there's there's a few comments and questions in the chat for you, if you don't mind taking a couple of those. Uh, Derek Hannon says, "Please show us the cat. We need to learn about both bryozoans <laughs> and cats." Okay. Well, oh no, I'm not sure if I can do that I mean, without. If the cat wants to be on camera, right? You know, we don't want to. There we go. We don't I'll turn off things. my virtual background. Happy Earth Day, kitty. <laughs> All right, we have to know. what What's your cat's name, Megan? Her name is Sybil. Sybil. Hi, Sybil. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks for joining if us. If we were on time, she would have been fine. She was napping until nine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the train was running a little bit late. Uh, okay, YouTube Lunkhead Fish, username, wants to know what role do Bryce Islands play in food webs? Um, they're filter feeders, so they're eating a lot of um, things like diatoms and, and um, little sort of um, photosynthesizing organisms that are smaller than they are? Uh, that's a good question, because like I said, the nudibranchs are one of the major predators of them. Um, and it's usually specific species of nudibranchs that eat bryozoans. It's not just all nudibranchs. 
they always have um, specialized diets, but yeah, it's, the food web for them doesn't go all that far. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I didn't, didn't know anything about Briah's Owens before, before meeting you. And then, uh, I mean, the incredible diversity, the shapes, sizes, the colors, uh, and the videos that you have of them are amazing. I love those, just they're mesmerizing, these little undulating shapes. Derek said that uh, they're cute little goosebumps. They're cute little what? Goosebumps. <laughs> I, I find them very cute. And each one has its own different like personality. Um, some, sometimes they're really shy and will um, go back into their little boxes on any sort of uh, stimulation. Others are just like, yeah, whatever. And they stay out all the time. Um, and I don't know, they just have really cool geometric patterns. So I think it's sort of a, they're cool for art too. I started getting into doing some art, using them as inspiration. Ooh, okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to throw one more question your way and then we're going to toss the conversation and bring in Bronwyn. Uh, what's the weirdest thing about Briah Owens? Derek is asking. <laughs> uh, what's the weirdest thing about Briah Owens? On any other day, I could probably answer this immediately. Um, can I talk about their anus? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's after nine o'clock. I think we're okay. So, uh, they used to be in the phylum ectoprocta, um, and um, the ectoprocta means outside anus. So the ring of tentacles is outside, uh, sorry, the anus is outside the ring of tentacles. There's another phylum called entoprocta, and um, people used to believe that they were related, but now we're finding that they're not. But the entoprocta, if you can guess, have their anus inside the ring of tentacles, which you might think is odd because it's in their mouth, like right in the mouth, but it all has to do with water flow. The bryozoans, the water flow goes, um, uh, comes from the top and goes through the tentacles. The water flow so comes from beneath and goes through the tentacles and out the top. And that's because they have little um, cilia on all their tentacles flow in, in those ways. That was the best answer to that question. <laughs> that was, in fact, Derek, yeah, that was the best way to answer that question. Excellent. Okay, let's bring in a research curator for non-molluscan invertebrates. Let's chat about freshwater inverts with Dr. Bronwyn Williams. <laughs> Hello. I hear you. <laughs> there we go. Now I see okay. you. I had no Welcome. control for a second. Yeah. Hello. I don't, I don't know how to follow that. I might just throw up my hands and say, all right, we're, we're good. What's the weirdest thing about crayfish? <laughs> we'll start there. We want to start there? No, no. How about something that they urinate in their, their faces, you know, to say hello? So. Okay. All right. We, should we just get to, get to the presentation and uh, nature is wild, y'all. Yeah, I don't know okay. if that's the weirdest thing, but you know that's that's kind of a little bit crazy. So, all right, let's see how I share screen here. Okay, this might be problematic. Bear with me. No worries. This is, this, is why, this is one of those situations where I love having a Mac where suddenly it's like, you have not set all the security. Uh... Oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay, Megan, can you talk for just a minute or two more? Or Chris, because I've actually got to get out of Zoom and back in. No worries. Okay. Because if I had to guess, Sybil the cat can keep us all going. Okay, I will be right back. my head right now. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Listen, we love biodiversity in all its forms at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, especially on Earth Day. This is what I deal with, working from home. Right. 
Uh, <laughs> I can't. I can't. This Earth Day train has run off the tracks. I'm not even. Uh, how how do I even ask you more about Brian Owens when Sybil? I, I don't know. Obviously, <laughs> taking over the show. All right. I think. Yeah, these moods. <laughs> okay. I think we've got the good Dr. Williams back in the show. Yeah, you know. <laughs> not nothing's yeah and sib we've got sib we've got everything this is great all right let's see if i can do that do this now looks great i see crayfish you know, that's what you're meant to see that's this is good all right okay so I'll try to try to keep this short and sweet because it is getting fairly late. And thank you everybody for bearing with us as uh, as we kind of draw to a close. And thank you, Chris, for and, and everybody for setting this up and, and kind of having us as the closers, as it will, including Sib. I think she stole the show. Um, so uh, as many of you may or may not know, so um, Although both Megan and I kind of oversee the, the non-molluscan invertebrate collection, which is a fantastic diversity of uh, organisms. We do specialize. You just heard about kind of the cool little bryozoans. I work on something I think equally cool, um, <laughs> uh, not marine, freshwater. Uh, many people may, may be very familiar with crayfishes um, in, in North Carolina. Um, we actually have a surprising, potentially surprising diversity of crayfishes. Chris, how many, how many species of native crayfishes do you think we've got in North Carolina? Uh, let's see, at least four. At least four, exactly. Uh, okay, oh, let's see, no, honest guess. Uh, species of crayfish in North Carolina, 25. A little bit higher. No. Yeah. Uh, 40. A little bit higher. What? Yeah. 57 species of crayfish. Uh, we'll get there, but right now we're at 46 indigenous species of crayfish that are known for North Carolina. Uh, and uh, there are a number of biologists um, in the state that are working on describing species as we speak. So, you know, for a state that I think a lot of us, at least that live in North Carolina, uh, think may be sort of well explored, this is still kind of this untouched diversity. So, um, Anyway, this is just a selection of some of the crayfish species that, uh, that we have uh, in the state of North Carolina. Here's some more. So, you know, they, I guess some of them look kind of just dull and brown, but uh, many of them, <laughs> sorry, Megan, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm laughing at Sybil <laughs> with this. This is fantastic. It's like, it's like the double presentation. <laughs> okay. All right, so, but in addition to crayfish and sort of crayfish in North Carolina, as well as the um, Southeastern US and, and beyond, um, I work on, um, well, some little critters that call crayfishes home. So like what um, Megan was talking about is bryozoans being kind of the encrusters or kind of those symbionts that glom onto something else. Um, crayfishes are, are host to a bunch of, um, little things as uh, little critters as well. We can start with this. So these are, these are not anything there. Well, I mean, they're symbiotic, I guess, in some respects. But for those of you who have not seen little tiny juvenile crayfish, um, that basically these, these are about the age, not quite the age when they're going to get weaned. Um, in theory, they're still gonna, if they're, they're scared, they're gonna kind of glom back on to their, their mother. So um, the mom is alive in that video, just so you know, she's just kind of going, oh dear God. But anyway, so with dozens and dozens of, of little uh, crayfishlets um, crawling around her. But if we look a little bit more closely, whoops. Um, yet again, we'll see things that don't look like miniature crayfish that seem to be kind of crawling around on, well, the external surface of the crayfish. So these crazy little um, see-through wormy-like critters are crayfish worms. Uh, they're in the order Branchiabdelida. 
Um, they are sister to the true leeches. So if some of you are thinking, boy, those look rather leech-like, they are rather leech-like, or, or alternatively, leeches are rather crayfish worm-like. Um, crayfish worms are not um, necessarily parasitic. Um, they're for the most part ectocommensals. So they just feed on detritus that builds up on the external surface of the crayfish. So they're kind of searching around for, uh, for food that's floating by or um, whatever. Anyway, they look like little inchworms. They have a posterior or butt sucker. And then their front sucker is actually the chin. Um, so there's that group of organisms. Very cool. Then there's another group of organisms that I work with. Uh, these tiny little crustaceans called um, ostracods in the family Entocytheridae. This is kind of a difficult video to show. These guys are tiny. So, so the crayfish worms, the worms themselves are pretty small. They range from about a millimeter in length to mm, about six millimeters, six to eight millimeters. So, I mean, you can, you can see those with the naked eye. These little ostracods are... Uh, they're about half a the large ones are about half a millimeter in length. So these are these are pretty tiny. They look like grains of sand. So, and just so you know that the, the little white dots kind of next to what was moving around, those are their little cocoons. So those are the little developing ostracod embryos. Okay. Because you can't get a good view of what those those entocytherid ostracods look like because they're so small. Here's one that accidentally got trapped on an air bubble kind of on a slide, so this is live. What's really interesting about these ostracods is that instead of having, instead of their legs being modified to help them sort of swim or move around, usually those of you who are familiar with ostracods um, sort of have little flagellate legs. These guys have, which is very difficult to see because this thing's just kicking up a storm, the ends of their, their walking legs um, actually have these crazy massive claws that they use to hang on to kind of seedy in the surface of, of the crayfish. So like the crayfish worms, these also are grazers. So they'll just feed off of, um, you know, detritus and sort of small organisms, di diatoms and such that, that build up on the surface of the crayfish. So that's all I have to show you. Let me come back to stopping this share. All right. So that's, yeah. I just thought we needed some videos to kind of end the, videos of strange things to end the, the night. Yeah. Definitely strange little little creatures. I mean, that's amazing. That it's almost like there's no stop. Like how how much more magnification can you go before it's like, oh, okay, you know, now we didn't find a living thing. There's something oh, well, living on everything. You need to get everything. a lot, lot farther. Yeah. So I mean, we've found. Um, I mean, we've found stalked ciliates on on both the worms and the entocytherids. Um, we've seen parasites in them. Uh, you could probably have parasites, the parasites. I mean, it's, 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 it's wild. Now, Bronwyn, I know that you've named and described new crayfish species, even very recently. Do ostracods and these little symbionts, are they host specific to like individual species of crayfish? Um, that is a great question. Um, and it, it's actually something that that I've been working on with Trish Weaver um, at the museum. So she's the, the collections manager of paleontology and geology um, and some collaborators um, that we have at the University of Illinois. Um, the question is yes, or the answer I guess is yes and no. So there appear to be some, some species of these symbionts, both the worms and the entocythrids that appear to be host specific and some that appear to be very host generalist. Um, and then some appear to be uh, sort of host generalist within a habitat. So let's say you have a, a stream, a reach of a stream, and you have a pool with two species of crayfish that sort of exist in the pool, and then you have a riffle or, you know, a rapid type of thing, two species of crayfish in, in the rapid. You'll see actually that the symbionts seem to partition out. So the two in the pool share the same symbiont communities, and the two in the, in the rapid share the same communities, but then those don't necessarily overlap. So, and that, oh, that nice. continues like up and down the stream. So those, you know, that kind of habitat specialization. So. Oh my gosh, the, that kind of diversity is mind boggling. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I've got a question for you from the chat. Uh, lunkhead fish are brachiodelians and entocithrid ostracods. I can tell I've been hanging around y'all a little bit because I can say those words. Are brachiodelians and entocithrid ostracods beneficial to the crayfish? Um, they have it. That's a great question. Um, it's brachiodelians have have uh, certainly been. I don't know why the word implicated is stuck in my head. That's not it, but they've been known as um, to engage in a cleaning symbiosis. Um, so that they'll, because they're feeding on sort of algae and other sort of gunk that, that builds up in the external surface of the crayfish, that that, that in turn then helps um, the crayfish, uh, you know, essentially kind of remain detritus free kind of from gunk building up on in the surfaces. Now the entocytherids are so tiny um, that I suspect they're doing the same thing, but with maybe a little bit less impact. Um, so maybe the numbers of each of those, those critters on the crayfish is going to have kind of, you know, dictate how much of an impact it has. So beneficial? Yes. Are there invasive or exotic ostracods? Uh, uh, of the flavor entos, entocytheridae, like of these entocythrid ostracods or just in general? Uh, I'm I, okay. I'm probably thinking in general, you know, of the tiny symbionts that you're talking about that live on crayfish, are there ones that are not from say North Carolina that wouldn't be here otherwise that you find living on crayfish? Yes. And um, they will transfer with their invasive hosts. Um, so for example, um, you know, the red swamp crayfish, which is, um, is, is certainly, it's kind of big in the, um, in the ag industry, right? That's kind of the one that we typically think of as being farmed. It's farmed in North Carolina. Um, it's not native to North Carolina, but it is spreading in some of, um, in, in several waterways. And uh, it brings with it kind of a number of symbionts that wouldn't, we wouldn't expect, both the entocythrids and the worms actually, that, that won't be native to North Carolina. Um, whether then those transfer on, you know, if, if those transfer onto the, the, the native crayfish is kind of a whole other question. Uh, sometimes the native crayfish don't make it in the face of these invaders, not the entocythrids, I guess, the crayfish. Crayfish right. invaders. Yes, I guess I need to be clearer with this. I'm, I'm sort of like picturing these little mini entocythrids, you know, ganging up and, and, and beating up native crayfish. <laughs> that, that doesn't happen. But that could be a horror movie. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another question from the chat for you: What's your field work to collect these like? Fun, typically. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I definitely I do a lot of field work. Um, Megan's actually joined me on on quite a few field trips, um, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess in the the the, the warmer months, um, just typically sandals or waiter boots and waiter socks and shorts, and you just go kind of trucking into sort of the creek or um, or wherever. And uh, uh, some some crayfish species will be under rocks. You start flipping rocks. We'll use either seines or uh, dip nets, kind of handheld dip nets. Um, some species will be kind of tucked up in the vegetation along the, the edges of the stream system. So you jab and kind of pull a lot. Um, we, uh, we will go uh, snorkeling um, at times in sort of deeper pools to try to get at some of, these, um, some of these critters. And then when it gets a little too cold, we throw the waders on. So um, yeah, but I, 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 will, I will admit, I've seen a lot of beautiful, places throughout North Carolina and, and, and beyond because of the, the, the work that I do. How do you choose where to go? Um, that is a great question. And in oftentimes that is blind and with a map. Um, it's, uh, so a lot of the work that I do is we try to be very systematic spatially. Um, and as you can imagine, sort of stream systems don't tend to, you know, they're not very grid-like. Um, so the Atlas and Gazetteer is my friend. I, essentially, I kind of use the, 
you know, how that's gridded out to just kind of say, all right, every X number of, you know, centimeters or inches, I'm going to try to sort of capture, you know, a site, some sort of, um, you know, access point to a stream or a river. Most of the time, that's going to be a bridge. Um, I guess the, the running joke is um, kind of freshwater, quite, uh, um, freshwater aquatic um, biologists kind of know a heck of a lot of, about what lives under bridges and not much beyond. Um, you know, bridge, bridge crossings are, are very easy access points. So, um, so yeah, and then it's just, you sort of drive to the spot and if you can get in, great. If not, you find something nearby. So it's, yeah, a lot of pre-planning and then uh, crossing your fingers that it works out. I, I have a sense that that's a lot of uh, biology field work. I think so, yes. <laughs> it's the fun of it, right? I mean, it's, you know, as, as uh, uh, one of my mentors said, it's all about plan flexibility, you know. Plan flexibility. Plan flexibility, yeah. Well, Bronwyn, uh, if people wanted to follow your lab's research, how can they do that? We are, um, so, so I'm on Twitter um, and my, it, well, me and my lab is on Twitter at, at BW Williams Lab. Uh, Megan um, is is also on Twitter and is probably a bit more active on Twitter than I am. So she's at uh, oh boy, McCuller M I. Uh, hopefully that's it. Or you you can we can look look at that anyway. Um, so yeah, Twitter, Instagram. We have a, a Facebook page um, for the museum uh, in Burbrick's group. So you could just look that up. Um, and uh, check out 1001jars.com. So we've got all sorts of really cool stuff for you there as well that you can actually access our social media feeds and uh, some of our, our awesome blogs that, that, that we're trying to do. So. Bronwyn, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. If you're still out there listening, thank you very much for joining us for our Earth Day party. And uh, hey, I'll see you around the museum. Hopefully one day soon when all of this is over and we're, we're back in our beloved museum halls. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chris. All right. Bye, everybody. Y'all take care. So, everybody, we made it. You made it. I made it. We're here at the end of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Earth Day, 50th anniversary celebration. We heard about sharks. We heard about how to discover and explore clouds. We just learned about the tiny facts of other little invertebrates hanging out in our oceans. You know, we learned about how Earth compares to Mars and Venus and what makes Earth so unique. And we learned a lot about conservation. Overall, we talked and learned and heard from amazing experts tonight in the natural world into the scientific process and gosh, what a good Earth Day. I hope that you've enjoyed our Earth Day Streamathon. Listen, the Museum of Natural is putting out great science content right now. Uh, go to naturalsciences.org, visit the Science at Home page. You can access it right there for science activities. Uh, you can see sort of what's the science video of the day happening. We're doing live stream. We're going to hear from uh, biologists and ecologists, conservation scientist Stephanie Shuttler, uh, the fancy scientist on Twitter on YouTube tomorrow at noon. Tomorrow night, we're going to hear from a planetary scientist. We're going to learn a lot more about Venus. And then again, Friday, we'll be celebrating Hubble's 30th anniversary. So, you know, like, subscribe to the museum's YouTube because you're going to want to know when we're putting out all this great science stuff. That I know YouTube. Thanks for watching. If you join us on Facebook, so glad that you could be there. Comments. Follow the museum on social media too: Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can find at Natural Sciences. We're there sharing all the great stuff that it's happening. Sciences. So from me to you, Happy Earth Day, everybody! And you know we've got to have a little bit of. It's an Earth Day party, everybody. Happy signing off. My name is Chris from the North Carolina.